Welcome to a man talking over various parts of the StarCraft 2 campaign. Well, my plan to do that started very poorly because we have this really interesting video phenomenon right here where the first time I played StarCraft 2, the footage of it entirely is locked on this Welcome to StarCraft 2 splash screen, but the audio and the mouse movements from the actual game were still captured in the recording, a most interesting anomaly. By sheer luck, I noticed that that had happened. So we cut to this, Welcome to StarCraft 2. I was like blown away by the beginning of StarCraft 2 because I knew about this game, it has this legendary reputation, and I knew quite a lot about how the game worked actually from the online scene. So when I booted up the game and you end up like here in this country and western bar, we're in South North America, there's a guy drinking his problems away, we're listening to Suspicious Minds on the jukebox. There's also a Space Marine. It's just like, what is going on right here? Maybe that was the idea, but like, when I came into this game, this gave me a really negative first impression. I was like, is this a joke? Like, what am I looking at here? <laughs> What's even going on? To some extent, it's because StarCraft 2 is very much a sequel to StarCraft 1. More legendary insight from Off ED here. And it actually does assume you've played it, which I totally haven't. So I have no idea what's going on, and the game does not make any effort to explain itself. So what I'm going to do is start the game again to get some footage of the start. And here, we have the opening cutscene. I've seen this because it's the trailer for the game, like back when it came out or something. And it has this legendary moment at the end, where it shows you a space marine suiting up. Hell, it's about time. And then he says that, and in retrospect, that's kind of like a joke, I guess. Like, I'm guessing that was supposed to be cool. I'm actually not sure how cool it was supposed to be. Also, the fact he had a cigar on, and then the face thing closes in front of him and seals him into his little lung cancer machine. I don't know, I like had a breakdown when I saw that. I was still like, is this a joke? Like, I'm still not quite sure <laughs> whether I'm supposed to be taking this seriously or not. Looking back on it... It doesn't seem that, like, out of place, but for this to be my first impression of the game, I was like, what is happening? Like, I thought this was, like, a high-prestige game. This looks like, like, a really try-hard or joke kind of game. Well, I think it's just because this is not what the game's known for at all, and perhaps it's just been forgotten how weird it is, like, the first impression it comes across with. Well, anyway, we're some drunk middle-aged guy hanging out in a country bar looking at anime waifus, getting angry at the TV and shooting it. I think this is like, because we're cool, right? Again, it's like, this is somebody's impression of what it's like to be cool. But like, I don't know, I'm from the future, I'm like, this guy sucks. <laughs> so I don't know, like, I wasn't impressed with Jim Rayner, who's like supposed to be this intergalactic space badass. I don't know. Well, what's even going on? I eventually gathered, because the game really does not tell you anything about its plot, that we're the leader of a long-standing rebellion, and what we're doing right here is we're shooting the government. We're going to shoot our way through this town. It's time to liberate them from the Dominion, which is like the human empire in the galaxy. We're the blue guys, the Dominion are the red guys. That makes things easier, doesn't it? I'm not sure, but I think the player is assumed to know who the main character is already, and the main character knows the other characters in the game, so they're not really introduced. There's something going on. It's the guy who doesn't know anything about StarCraft lore, trying to play StarCraft, and being perplexed at what's going on. It doesn't necessarily matter. What matters, of course, is that our blue guys are going to walk around this map shooting red guys. I'm going to skip over this first mission because basically nothing happens. We liberate this town and we blow everything up along the way, and that's probably a good thing. One thing that was like taking me by surprise, I remember, was that I had remembered people saying, like back in the day, that StarCraft II was like the pinnacle of an RTS campaign. And it, for me, it just starts really badly. Like I did not enjoy the beginning. I was just like laughing at it. I thought it was a joke. I was like, wow, I could just mock this endlessly. And this, like the space marine from the cutscene comes back. He walks in to meet the main character and the faceplate opens to reveal he's still smoking the cigar. And I was just like, I don't know if this is like the, the developers thinking, yeah, this would be really cool or whether it's supposed to be a joke because it's not played as a joke <laughs> at all. I don't know. I don't know. I'm having a meltdown. I'm trying to work out whether it's cringe or not, basically, to use the modern parlance. There's something really off-putting about the way the game presents itself, but only literally in the first couple of missions. It becomes normal after a while. It becomes what I expected it to be the whole time after a while. It just starts off with this weird western thing going on. 
Well, anyway, the next mission comes about and the game kind of gets started here where we're going to capture some sort of mysterious alien artifact that was found on the planet that the human dominion is going after as well. And that's where the plot's going to get started once we find some sort of MacGuffin. And the game gets started in that you get a base and we see some of the more normal RTS gameplay. It's this kind of RTS, the old-fashioned kind of RTS, because this is a very direct sequel to an old-fashioned RTS, which generally has kept the mechanics intact, as far as I can tell. I've only seen like two minutes of StarCraft footage in my life. But as far as I recall, it's this, but in 2D. We have a resource building that is going to get us some resources using quote-unquote villagers, the like, resource generating unit, the SCVs they're called. I wanted to call them the villagers because that's how I was thinking about them. Like using Age of Empires 2 game logic, which is where I was coming at this from, is fine because it works in a similar sort of way and the kinds of strategies you want to use are gonna be the same sorts of things where it's mainly a focus on never having a building not be doing something and never floating resources. So in terms of the micro, you just have to keep your base doing something and that will be a good enough strategy. The only wrong strategy is to have resources and not be spending them. One of those things where I remember when I was much younger playing strategy games, I was always like, yes, hoard resources in case you need them. But you sort of have to get used to thinking that the only purpose to getting resources is to spend them immediately. And every second you're not spending them is a second you're not doing something with the stuff that resources would have bought. So essentially what that means in practical terms is the main goal early on in every mission is to spend all your resources making the stuff that gets more resources. Once you've maxed out and saturated your bases, just spend it all on units and upgrades constantly. And if you ever hit the pop cap, something's gone wrong. Like you should have been using the units the whole time and losing them in battle. Something, something, something. The grand strategy master of StarCraft 2 is here. I know all the strategies. Although that said, I actually did have some idea of how to play the game going in. And that was because of the StarCraft 2 competitive scene that I was vaguely aware of. Back in the day, I'm not sure how many days ago this was, like seven years ago or something, I was a big Total Biscuit fan, if you know that guy. A gaming commentator who tragically passed away but was very popular at the time and he was into StarCraft quite a lot. He did a lot of StarCraft casting of like the competitive scene. So vaguely through him, I was aware of the competitive scene, well, the old competitive scene, at least I haven't really seen anything new since then. And I'll also add, while I'm on this topic, that you might have noted my commentary style is moderately influenced by Total Biscuit, if anyone remembers exactly what that style was. He had a similar passion for complaining about mechanics and video games to me, but also for praising them. And I find myself to be a more boring version of that approach, where I don't like the things I like about video games as much as he did, nor do I hate the things I hate about video games as much as he did. So I view myself as a more diplomatic, I like to put it, video game commentator. All of this doesn't matter if you don't know who I'm talking about. Essentially, it was a blast from the past for me to be playing this game that I'd seen somebody who I used to watch in the way that you're watching me quite a lot years and years ago. Something was going on. I remember thinking it was quite nice that somewhere in the game there is the ability to buy a Total Biscuit voice pack, which I think only applies in multiplayer. There's some sort of in-game memorial to this guy who was foundational in keeping the game alive a long time ago by being a big English language caster of a video game scene that generally was taking place in Asia. Something something. There's some video game history here that does not apply to what we're seeing on the screen once again. So let's try to rein in the OFED ranting for a second. As for this mission, there's not much for us to do because it's the usual RTS thing where as you go through the campaign it gradually unlocks the various units your faction has. So to start with, all we can do is make our basic unit the Marine and spam them towards the enemy base. We've also got the Medic which keeps them alive, don't really need them that much in this case. And that does everything we need to do. We take out the base, although it takes a while because the marines aren't that good at shooting down buildings. This allows us to capture the thing, the alien Zelnaga artifact that the human empire was after. Now we have it, and that will turn out to be important in various ways, of course. To celebrate our victory, we're back in the depressing bar. We've got a whiskey in one hand and a revolver in the other. I think it's supposed to come across that we're really cool and edgy in some way, 
I don't know. To me, it comes across like we're suicidal. It's less yee-haw fun than I think it's supposed to be. Well, anyway, we can look at this thing on the wall and they talk about the Zerg Wars. The way things like this are presented makes it very clear you're supposed to know what the characters are talking about. Because I think a lot of this stuff and optional lore is references to things that happened in another game or another campaign I don't even know at this stage. Well, the main thing to note is that as we look at this photograph on the wall, it's in black and white, and I was like, it really is the 1960s or 70s or something. Like, the thing that happened a few years ago in the lore is in a black and white photograph. I don't know, what happened to it being the future? Why does it say 0.02 in the background? Does that mean something? I want to see the timeline of human civilization that brought this guy to this bar hundreds of years in the future. Why did not only nothing change, but things go backwards slightly to a very specific point and then stay there? Something, something. We need a sociology PhD or an anthropology PhD to analyze the StarCraft universe. Well, looks like we don't have time for that because it turns out that capturing that thing has attracted the attention of the Zerg, mankind's enemy, an alien race bent on the destruction of all life in the galaxy, or something, it's just that sort of thing. The trope basically is happening there. It's the Tyranids from Warhammer back at it again in StarCraft. And they want to kill us. So now we have a timed defense mission where you have to not die for 20 minutes. To help us out, we've now unlocked the Bunker, which is a building that allows you to garrison units to make them slightly more effective or at least be protected for a while. Well, you only have to defend your base. There are various things you can do by leaving the base. There we saw me losing a part of my army by walking into the enemy base by accident. That went well. But at least our base defense is going fine. A bunker full of marines will do just fine against the low-level trash that the Zerg are going to be sending at us for this stage. They're just like insect things. You'll see them around the place getting shot. There's probably some lore to what the Zerg are, but they aren't introduced at all in this campaign. Again, because you're probably supposed to know what's going on. We're under attack by the swarm. Let's shoot them. And it turns out they die pretty easily, so it's less of a problem than was advertised. There are various events in this mission where you can go out of your base to save some troops to get more men. And because I'd already actually cleared out the area where they're spawning for this one, we can just go there and get them for free, so that's handy. We ended up with a substantial ball of infantry. I'm probably just building up a bit faster than the game needs you to, because this is still supposed to be the beginning of the game. So we end up with these fully garrisoned bunkers that are easily holding off the enemy. But I also have this ball of troops that I need to do something with. The game really wants me to put them in these other bunkers deeper into the base, but I just sort of figured they don't need to be there. Instead, we go out to explore the map some more, and the enemy are coming from three bases, and you are allowed to just go and attack those bases, which gives you the added advantage of there being resource pickups here, and the bases have long-term resources that you can secure and try to mine, well, we'll see how that goes. We still don't have much in the way of unit selection, so we're just spamming the generic weakest Terran unit at the enemy. Eventually, it does get the job done. We do suffer from... These big arm things, don't know what they're called, these things that are whipping at me, which do a decent amount of damage, but because I have this ball of medics in amongst the marines, the, me the medics will constantly be regenerating the health of the marines. They can't do that infinitely, it costs their energy, like their stamina to do so. So you do actually have a finite pool of health, even with health regeneration. It just comes back over time, something, 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 doesn't matter. We were doing okay, basically. This ball of marines is destroying one of these enemy bases. So that's going to lessen the intensity of the attacks against us. And also, once the base is gone, I can make my own base there. Although you also have to wait for the Zerg slime, the creep as it's called, to go away. So you have to wait a while, that's why I was just standing there before I was making the base. That will allow us to secure some resources, because the things you mine on the map are finite. There's only a certain amount of resources on the map. You probably want to secure as much as you can before the enemy mines them and spends them on units to attack you. Just the classic RTS thing where being hyper aggressive is usually the easiest strategy, even though it kind of seems like it's dangerous, it's usually safer than not doing it. The problem we faced though is that after taking one enemy base area, the enemy start to take it back. They have these units called Nidus Worms that allow them to essentially appear anywhere. It's these weird mouth things here. So they can start spawning units back where their base used to be, and I guess they're scripted to try and take it back after you take it. So we end up fighting over the base and not really building it. We do also destroy their main base at the back pretty substantially. 
That means the actual base defense thing that this mission was about barely has any action. Like, well, I don't know what happened back there. Nothing, I guess. I never had to look back and deal with any situations back here. Only a few things were attacking us. We mainly were actually defeating the Zerg, but in the top right you can see the timers counting down to us being evacuated because we're being overwhelmed by the Zerg. That classic situation. I actually am going to fall back here because I kind of realized there's no point to this and I decided to keep some of my units alive. Does this matter? No it doesn't because everything gets deleted at the end of the stage of course. Here I'm actually going to save this ball of medics by bothering to select just my marines to target these Zerg. That's a problem by the way that seemed to come up for me quite a lot. One thing the game really lacks is a way to select like one type of unit really easily within a ball of different types of units so you can give them separate orders. Maybe we'll talk about that later. What's happening now? It's the classic. You win, you lose ending. So obviously, we were completely dominating the enemy, but the story requires that you are about to die and you were just about evacuated. So it decides to just show a cutscene of you losing, and then we escape. There's a dramatic scene where a spaceship comes and machine guns down a bunch of flying things, and we got out of there. Tychus is no longer smoking a cigar, representing that we've moved into the serious part of the game, where we have a different hub, which will be this spaceship, and the game is less country and western from here on out. Also, it's got TV, this place, and we learn that the Zerg are attacking all over the galaxy. Well, it doesn't have very good TV by the looks of things. Things still aren't going very well in the future. But what's worse than that, I think you're supposed to know this already, it is told to you later, but the Zerg commander who we just saw on TV is the main character, Raynor's girlfriend. Why? Insert commentary of a different thing that explained that here. I think it actually does explain it later in the game, like it gives you a flashback where you see why your girlfriend is the leader of the alien race trying to destroy humanity. There's some kind of reason behind it. We're going to move swiftly on to something much more important. We're at the store. There's this upgrade store in your ship where you have to pay some guy to upgrade your units. This is quite fun, so you can pick out the units you like the most and give them extra abilities. And there isn't enough money available in the game, I don't think, to get the majority of the upgrades. So you need to sort of pick what things you like using in the campaign and buy the upgrades you like for them. So here, for example, I can choose between having bunkers have more range, or the things garrisoned into them getting more range, I should say, or being able to garrison more things into them. I picked the wrong choice here. I went for the added bunker slots instead of range, and I remember regretting this because I was just thinking, like afterwards, if you had two guys standing behind your bunker, that's basically the same as having those two guys be inside the bunker as well. But missing out on the extra range could be a problem. There are units that can outrange the bunker, and just for the generic like anti-Zerg situations where they're just running at you, having more range just means more DPS, whereas having more troops in the bunker doesn't mean more DPS, because the troops just standing behind the bunker would also be doing the same amount of damage, since the Zerg tends to close to melee range and will just be meleeing the bunker. Something something. I think that was the wrong decision. So there's my strategy commentary on the <laughs> upgrade trees. It's what I was not doing that was the correct decision. I also picked stim packs for infantry. So that's an ability where you can press a hotkey while you have infantry selected to reduce their health but increase their damage and fire rate. But the key there is that thing I just said, while you have infantry selected. It's hard to take a group of units and be like, I'm just going to select the infantry here because I believe you have to double click on the model. I don't know if there's a hotkey to be like, select just one type of unit from this ball. And if you have a ball of units selected, you can't use any hotkeyed abilities on them like the stim pack. Unless they're like the first thing in the pile. It's kind of hard to explain. Like when you select a ball, it selects something within the ball to be the more selected thing than anything else. And your hotkeys will only apply to that type of thing or that individual unit, perhaps. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'll try and show you later. Essentially, I got this upgrade for Marine Infantry and I never used it. I knew it was there, and occasionally thought of using it, but it was too annoying. So I think passive upgrades that don't require hotkeys kind of gels with the game a bit more, and you can really feel that it's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to, like, control group individual unit types within your army to easily use their hotkeyable abilities. For me, 
I guess it was too annoying. Like, I wanted to use those things, but I felt like it was too difficult to actually do it. And it also felt like there would be an easier way to do it. Again, it's because I played Supreme Commander, where you can be like, press Control S and it selects all of the naval units on the screen or something like that. And having that ability to differentiate stuff out of a ball really easily makes microing more fun and more easy. Something, something, something. While I was having a breakdown there over essentially nothing, we're here to save a colony from Zerg attacks, and you might have seen, you have some slightly non-linear choices about how to take on the missions in the game, and there probably are some correct and incorrect decisions, because the various missions you do unlock new units, so you're changing the order in which you unlock stuff. So presumably there'll be cases where one mission would be really easy if you had a certain unit available, but you have to do another mission first to get that, and you just have to know that order and pull it off. So. We're not going to benefit from any such strategies as that, but they will certainly exist. It's just nice that you have the choice to do stuff, and you get slightly different mission rewards as well. It's not a big deal, because I'm pretty sure you have to do all of the missions, as far as I can tell. So it's not actually non-linear. It's more like it's linear with some turbulence going on. It's nice to have the decision-making available to you. It's nice to feel like your inputs are affecting something in-universe and affecting your progression through the game. It's nice to feel like you are playing a game. I've got all the best StarCraft 2 commentary right here. I did want to say that I feel like, with StarCraft 2, I'm obviously missing stuff. Like, I'm sitting here and I'm kind of like bemused by the whole thing. The game is so obviously a mechanical successor slash throwback to an old game I haven't played, and of course is very much a plot continuation of something I haven't played. And it gives me the sense that this game is like talking to somebody else while I'm playing it. That's the best way of putting it that I can think of. Oh, by the way, here's that thing I was just ranting about. See, the fire bats are kind of more selected at that window at the bottom than the medics. So I think that means if the fire bats had a hotkeyable ability, I could do it now, even with the medic selected. But if there were also marines in the group, I wouldn't be able to use their hotkey ability because the firebats are selected and I would have to sort of click in and try to just select the marines to use the stim packs. I'm making my excuses obviously well in advance. I'm not going to be using very many hotkey abilities. I am a hotkey fan and I was using it for the economy, but for microing the units, it just wasn't quite there for me. It felt too inconvenient. I'm making a commentary on something I'm not going to be showing once again in an off -ED video. I'll just make this in advance. Throughout the video, I could be doing more stuff with a lot of my units and using special abilities, but I tended to press F2, which is a pre-made hotkey that selects all of your military, press A on the keyboard, which turns your commands into attack move, and then click somewhere on the map. That does the business. It makes a big ball of units that will just run at the enemy. And in many cases, that's enough because the game takes place at very short range with this old school RC RTS style. Balls of units are pretty effective. We'll talk more about ball strategies in a bit, I think. What was happening while I was ranting? Well, for this mission, you have to protect trucks as they drive from one side of the map to the other. Fortunately, it's quite easy because the game has an automatic guard mode. Like, if you select a bunch of your units and right-click on the thing to protect, the AI will just try to protect that thing. It will keep the units near it and will attack things that come close on its own and then go back to guarding the thing with no extra commands from the player. So that was really good. That's very neato makes this mission pretty easy. And I spend a lot of the time just sort of wandering around. You can again explore parts of the map that you don't need to go to to find resources, but you also don't need those resources. So I'm guessing it only matters if you're playing on like the hardest difficulty or something and you really have to use everything at your disposal. For me, I can just put down bunkers and army units in the places where the enemy can get up to the road. I think there were only three or four parts of the map where the road could be accessed from the rest of the map. So defending those choke points would make defending the convoy trivially easy. And the only finesse to the strategy is that you can also make your infantry producing buildings at the choke point so that you have a continuous supply of units at the places where they're going to fight. That's probably the only difference between doing this in the laziest possible way and doing it in a slightly proactive way, like making forward bases that have more than just a bunker is a good idea because you can't spend your resources fast enough to just produce from one barracks in your own base. So you might as well have more than one and you might as well put them in the place where the units will be fighting for most of the stage. There we have it. There's a little bit of strategy at the very least. Like in the previous stage, 
I believe you can make the defensive task easier by taking out a couple of enemy bases on the map, although also a lot of the enemies appeared to spawn by just falling from the sky or coming out of the ground, and I don't know to what extent that's connected to the existence of the enemy bases. I essentially don't really know how the Zerg work as a faction. They're a whole thing, and they have different mechanics, so it's not a like a symmetrical strategy game like many of the three faction strategy games that exist. But the point is, I fought the Zerg in the corner for a bit, you don't have to do this, and I don't know whether this matters at all, so I can't necessarily comment on the validity of this strategy. Well, one thing that happened is I lost a whole bunch of units, especially the Firebats. That's the new unit for this mission. They're sort of a melee unit. They're a flamethrower unit with extremely short range, so for all intents and purposes, they are a melee unit. But you could also just consider them a tank unit because they have armor. There's this armor system in the game that I don't think the game really talks about in its campaign. But I think there's some kind of heavy and light attack system and also heavy and light defenses on various units, and they block damage in some way through that. Well, there you go. That's about the extent of my knowledge, so that's how much the game tells you. I'm fairly sure there's something a little bit complicated going on with armor and defenses for various unit classes. Well, the point is, we quite easily defend the road, and it's another you win, you lose, where we were like destroying the enemy base by the end, and then it cuts to a cutscene of the entire map being overwhelmed by the enemy. Well, we fled with some civilians and saved an NPC who'll give us more missions later. We also unlock the mercenary system. This is the ability to recruit slightly better versions of various units. The main downside to this is there's a big cooldown on recruiting them, and the cooldown triggers from the start of the mission. And quite often, I found myself ready to buy these mercenaries, but because you can't buy them within like the first five minutes of a stage, like, they weren't to hand, so I spent the resources instead on normal units, not wanting to float the resources. So I didn't use these mercenaries, as much as would have been beneficial, because I just used normal units that are worse a lot of the time. And I'm blaming somebody else for this, of course, essentially, as usual. I'm blaming the fact that I'm too good at the game, I think. Well, anyway, the good news is, even though we got out of that old-fashioned country and western bar, this spaceship also has an old-fashioned country and western bar on it. I think it might even be like the same bar, like we've ripped the parts out and put them here, even though I thought we were trying to escape in a hurry, but we had to go back for the jukebox or something. I don't know what's going on. We're still depressed and drinking, even in space. But this bar has a mini game in it, so let's just play this. And I don't have that much to criticize about StarCraft 2, so I wanted to criticize this mini game instead, just to get it out of my system. It has four directional movement, and that seriously sucks. I've actually been aged 40 years by talking about this minigame, Lost Viking it's called. The big problem is you move with the arrow keys on the keyboard and there are only four of them. And what you can't do is the really obvious way that this should have been controlled on the mouse. Like this is a game with mouse controls, I'm holding the mouse, but you can't move your thing along with the mouse which would be so intuitive, so smooth, be both easier and have a higher skill ceiling. Although not necessarily, because getting used to using such limited controls is a sort of skill activity unto itself. Well anyway, I was finding it very unfun to control the thing in Lost Viking. We got to this boss and died, and I was like, well, that was very unsatisfying. The whole time, I was like, I can dodge this, but you can't move up and right or something like that so your brain was betraying you. You actually couldn't dodge this if you can only move right and up. Something, something, something. I got mad at Lost Viking. We're going to move back on to the real game where we have some more missions to choose from. Each mission chain is essentially given to you by an NPC and all of them are people you're presumed to know. And here's just another one we don't know. Some guy tells us to go and gather some minerals on a lava planet. They're special minerals in some way. They are yellow ones, although in gameplay terms, they seem to function exactly the same. So we have what is here, a gimmick mission. Our goal is to get a certain amount of resources, and now and again, the resources on the map will be covered by lava and you can't pick them up. StarCraft II's campaign is pretty good for its gimmick missions. Like lots of missions are not just basically tutorials for a certain unit, which is the way they could have done this. Sometimes they'll just be fun challenges, or like things to do that are a bit different to the normal gameplay. In this case, the unit it was introducing is this guy, the Reaper, who I remembered from watching 
online StarCraft 2 because spamming a couple of Reapers at the beginning of a multiplayer stage was like a classic thing to do. They can jump over various terrain items and do very fast timing attacks and stuff, and in this stage they can reach secret areas to get more resources. And there's the lava I mentioned that just covers the map. It's not necessarily like the best gimmick because you just do nothing while the lava's here. It's just to see whether you remembered to get out of the way or not, I guess. Luckily it doesn't last too long and you can go back to playing after that. There's also the question of how many resources you spend defending your bases, because the goal is to get resources, but as you can see I don't have any resources because I'm spending them on trying to get resources and trying not to die in the process, not really knowing how much defensive power we need. Here's a big issue though I had. I've sent like 20 SCVs to go and start a new base near some new resources, but early in the game you are not allowed to use more than one SCV to build a thing. This is an unlockable ability that comes fairly late in the game. So that means when I want to start this new command centre here, the thing your guys drop resources off at, I can't just quickly build it with all of these idle SCVs. One of them very slowly builds it. The rest can do some long range mining by dragging stuff all the way back to our original base location. So I can make some use of them, but that was surprising. That feels like too much of a limitation. It's too fundamental to like so many possible strategies that it, it should be something you have to unlock. Just feels really weird that that particular thing was behind a wall, and it's a wall that doesn't get broken until quite late in the campaign. You might have seen there, I had a command centre flying around. This is the unique thing about the Terran faction. Many of their buildings can move. And this is something where when I saw this, I was like, that's really interesting. I think it should have lent into that more. Which I say because of like an, a reaction I had to this game overall. When I was playing this, especially early in the campaign, I was kind of thinking, like, why is this game famous? This game's really tropey, or it's kind of try-hard, it's like, it's just really normal, I guess that's one way of putting it. I was playing it and thinking, why did this become the competitive strategic phenomenon or something, when every game is like this? Like, isn't this just like completely standard, fair, generic, like it's the first thing you would think of if you were asked to make an old school RTS. Well, perhaps we have something of a Hitchcock effect going on, I don't know what this is actually called. But if you watch like old Alfred Hitchcock movies, they're so boring and so cliched and so tropey from the perspective of a modern audience, but it's because everyone was so influenced by those films that they copied them and everyone has copied them forever ever since. So you go back and the shooting style, all the details of how the story is put across are really normal feeling and it's really uninteresting as a result. Or less interesting than it could be basically for a, a story that it has the same content but told differently. And that's kind of how I feel about StarCraft 2. Like I'm looking back on this from the future being like I've played every RTS that isn't StarCraft 2 so when I play StarCraft 2 I'm like well it's just like those other games, but I think it's actually going to be like the other way around. So I'll give that in the game's defence here. I'm pretty sure it's everyone else who sucks. And the reason I mention that in tandem with the buildings being able to fly thing is buildings being able to fly would be an example of something where like if the game was more about that, you had a more nomadic base, that would feel more different to other RTSs and would be more of a mechanical identity to the game. And it's kind of there a little bit, it just doesn't really come up or lean into it at all and the other main factions can't do it, so you can't really base the game around that idea. It's something, I don't know, I wanted to play Homeworld I guess, you know, every time I play a game I'm thinking of like individual elements I liked from different games. And of course with StarCraft 2, the big one that overrides everything else I've said so far is going to be the camera, like as always. The camera's too, too close to the ground, like right now I want to control things at all three of my bases. I'm sure my PC could render them if I scrolled out to be able to see all three so I could click on them more easily, but I can't. And another thing to mention actually along those lines is that there is a, a divide in the RTS world, perhaps a divide in history between the WASD RTS and the old school RTS, that being one where your left hand either controls mechanical inputs or it controls the camera. Over time, left hand has drifted towards controlling the camera because I guess people just prefer it and that's how other games tend to work as well, so it just gels with a more general audience. 
StarCraft 2 is of the older variety, where you control the camera by moving the mouse to the edge of the screen, the classic maneuver, which is kind of hard, and when you combine that with the camera being zoomed in, your camera options are just constantly limited, and it's something you have to get used to not thinking about. But when you see it resolved in other games by having it either on the left hand or having the camera zoom be more liberal, well, you can't go back. It's that old situation. Like, I played this right after playing Supreme Commander, and it's just night and day in terms of the freedom to be addressing the thing that's happening that you want at any given time, which is very closely tied to being able to move the camera wherever you want. Something, something, something. This is how it used to be. This is how all games were. I'm sure they had valid reasons, but I'm still mad. What, what I want to avoid is a future where there's a StarCraft 3 and the designers are like, yep, it's a game where the camera should be close to the ground because like that's part of the game in some way. Like not being able to see the whole theater is the challenge or something. I would just want everyone to throw that idea out and be like, you know what? Let's give the player as much freedom to look at stuff as possible. And that essentially means in practice, camera zoom restrictions being lifted and probably giving a left hand controls the camera style situation. I think the Total War games did this back in the day as well, where they let you choose whether your left hand was doing camera stuff or hotkey stuff. And generally, your left hand doing camera stuff also allows you to do hotkey stuff. It's just that because in RTSs like this, in old school RTSs, there are usually so many hotkeys, and for high level play you need all of them, that you need a lot of keys to be near where your left hand is. So you kind of like don't want to put W, A, S and D onto something that isn't hotkeys because there are so many functions that are going to need those keys. It's a difficult situation, but I'd like to see a perfect world where lots of inputs are attached to the mouse, at least optionally, and the camera movements can be done at the same time as things that require you to do mouse commands because moving the camera with the mouse stops you from playing the game in a game where a lot of the game requires you to click on things in the middle of the screen but the camera controls require you to have the mouse not in the middle of the screen. It's holding everything back and it's one of the reasons I think why StarCraft 2 is such a high skill game to play like in the online scene. It's because of a problem in the game essentially it's because there's a dissonance between the camera controls and the game's controls you can't do them simultaneously by design which makes it hard to get good at the game because it's in your advantage to be able to do both at the same time so if you can just use the hotkeys really fast and set up like camera save points where you can use hotkeys to jump the camera to different places on the map you can do stuff to get around these issues it feels like though in other games the game itself found a way to get around these issues and people were probably happier for it. I dream of a better world where probably humans have forearms or keyboards are fundamentally redesigned. I don't know, there, there's too much like mental stuff that humans can do that our way of interfacing with the machine stops us from doing, that it's making life hard for everybody except pro StarCraft gamers who manage to get around those problems. I am advocating that in StarCraft 3, it should let you plug your brain in and just directly neural interface with your neocortex. And in that way, I'll be able to move the camera wherever I like. Problem solved. It was that easy. And now Activision Blizzard or Microsoft, whoever owns this franchise at the moment, you owe me £12,000 for that game design consultancy fee. Now let's move on. Ultimately, I found out that I'd put too much of my resources into military because the Zerg barely tried to stop me from taking the minerals and I massively overestimated or overguessed, I guess, what I was going to be facing. But there is one important consideration to make. There is a secondary objective to kill this big Zerg in the corner, so I needed to make sure I stopped getting resources too quickly towards the end so I could go and do that. And I did it in well, just about the worst way possible. I've got these Reapers who just go and shoot it in the face. I could have jumped down the cliff with the Reapers and shot it from a place where it couldn't attack me using the Reapers special ability. Instead, we just got the Reapers killed, which of course doesn't matter because there's no persistency between stages, which is a shame in my opinion. It doesn't matter how badly things go as long as you do the objective. It's one of those kinds of games. After that, we unlock the research tree. So this is separate to the paid upgrades. The various secondary objectives in many stages give you research points 
that you spend on upgrades, and here you have to make a choice between one of two things for each tier of upgrade. It's a case where you aren't necessarily given enough information to actually make this decision in my opinion, but you can kind of glean the information from what it does show you, the videos of what the thing does. So here it's telling me I could upgrade my bunkers to have a turret, or I can upgrade them to have extra health as the alternative thing. I noticed though that at the next tier you can also get a turret style upgrade, a standalone building, and by just comparing the two videos of the turrets in action, we can see that the turret you get at the next tier is way better. So while I don't really know whether it's good to have 150 life on a bunker or to have this turret, because I don't know how much life a bunker has anyway, and I don't know how much damage the turret is doing, we can guess from this video by the fact that two of the turrets struggle to kill like four zerglings, the weakest thing in the game, that they're probably not very useful at all. Therefore, I should take the other one, even though I also have no idea how useful that is. So that's the kind of decision-making process that's going into decisions like these. And the comment is that it would be great if it just told you a little bit more in these information boxes. Like if it was telling me you get 150 life, is that on top of having 50 life? Is it on top of having 1000 life? Like that's a big difference. What actual percentage increase are you getting off this? And so to what extent are you increasing the performance of the unit by getting the upgrade? Well, I didn't know, and I went for the health one. Looks like our scientists are growing some zerg samples on the ship. This seems like a really bad idea, but well, I'm not the expert, you carry on. Let's go and do another mission. We're going to do the next quote-unquote plot mission. They're all plot missions really, but this is the main story, us collecting these artifact things. At least it will turn out to be the main story. So Tychus has another lead on something. This time it's in a Protoss base, but actually we start off by fighting some Zerg in this mission. The Zerg are attacking the Protoss base that you have to attack. So there's a kind of soft time limit in that if you take too long, I guess the Zerg will complete the objective first and you lose. However, if you go out and kill some of the Zerg early, you can grab some of those optional research objectives. So I'm just building a big ball of infantry that now includes a newly unlocked Marauder unit firing those rockets we see, and we eventually take them out to fight the Protoss. This is another missed opportunity I thought, because I'm coming into this game as somebody who doesn't really know what the Protoss are, but everybody in universe knows what they are, and the game presumes that you know what they are. So we start fighting this new faction of aliens effectively, the kind of like elves, you know how it is with tropes, and well, to me it's just like more things to shoot, but I had no understanding of what was happening in the lore whatsoever. Again, this doesn't really matter, but it feels like a bit of effort probably should have been made to be like, hey, Rainer, you want me to remind you what the Protoss even are, or like what the deal is, or why we're fighting them, that sort of thing. That would be nice. I guess it doesn't matter. We're fighting these guys who are kind of blue and yellow. That's about all we need to know. Here we have an interesting situation where I've got this SCV stuck in the corner. I didn't know that these supply depots, which are effectively like houses from Age of Empires, that's how I'm thinking of them, you can press a button on them to make them go into the ground so that they become passable. So having that SCV trapped in the corner was a solvable situation. I could have made a little corridor for that guy to escape. Doesn't really matter. So my ball of general infantry takes out the Protoss base, and then we go to capture the thing. It turns out to be guarded by some other things that die almost instantly. What I was thinking would happen here is there'd be like a defense stage, so you capture the thing and then the zerg would come in and you'd have to hold it against a massive zerg wave. And that's why I've got barrackses flying over to set up in the Protoss base, thinking I need like an output of units here to defend against the end stage objective. Turns out though that just defeating those three things was the end stage objective. And it was just really easy with a ball of not particularly well composed infantry. I guess we're still in the early game, so just like doing the only strategy possible, that is making the only units you're allowed to build and just walking towards the enemy, does the trick. And we probably could have made more as well, didn't go up to the pop cap or use all the resources or anything. I don't know. I'm just too good for normal difficulty. The king of normal difficulty is back at it again. Well after this, Kerrigan, the Zerg Queen, was harassing us over the phone. And we are now told through Tychus learning it that Kerrigan is Rayner's ex-girlfriend in some way. And maybe Rayner feels like it's partially his fault that his girlfriend ended up turning to the dark side and becoming queen of the aliens. I don't think it is. I can't quite remember. Again, I'm not quite sure to what extent you're supposed to know about this already. 
something's happening, we have a link to somebody we'll see later in the story. That's essentially what they're doing. 47 minutes later, we're back in the bar drinking about it. Tigus could probably ask Reyna what the deal is here, but fortunately he doesn't. I think if you click on him here, he might actually expound upon it. Lots of the cutscenes are optional in the game. Well, I just enjoyed that how after so many missions in the game, you have all this drama in the cutscenes, and it always just cuts back to Reyna <laughs> drinking whiskey in a bar. Like, that's just always the end point of every story beat, is that Reyna gets drunk and looks depressed. That's just his character, I guess. And as I said, I'm fairly certain that in these stages in between missions, if you go around the various rooms of the ship and click on people, they will say other things that extend upon the cutscenes to some extent. But more importantly, we've got upgrades to buy. Here was a really good looking one. You can have the new Marauder Heavy Infantry slow the enemy down when they attack them. I believe it's also area of effect as well. So just having a couple of Marauders amongst your army will slow down large portions of enemy armies. And that's just a huge deal when you're facing melee attackers, which is quite often in this game. Slowdowns are often the kind of upgrade that have runaway positive effects, because if you slow the enemy down as they're coming at you, you'll do more damage to them, they'll do less damage to you, which snowballs because fights are positive feedback loops, so just having one or two seconds of extra damage can be the difference between winning with no damage and losing half your army. So something like slowing down the enemy is something that seems really powerful, that's what I'm saying. Not that I really checked or ever knew, because of course I barely played any of the game without this upgrade, so I don't really know what the difference is. And the other option there was to take Marauder Health, which is another case where it's like, well I don't remember how much health they have, so telling me I can spend all this money to get 25 health doesn't mean enough. I think a bit more information needs to go on both the research screens and the armory upgrade screens to make those decisions more interesting and worthwhile. Well anyway, we're moving on to the next mission. Looks like we're going to do another Tosh mission. Like Tosh is collecting dogs. rare resources, and it's implied he's doing it for a nefarious reason, but we're going along with it anyway because he pays us money to do so, and I guess it's something to do. It's content for the game, isn't it? He actually explains in this cutscene a little bit about what the Protoss were. Would have been good to have that before the previous stage. We're fighting not the actual Protoss, but like a spin-off faction of the Protoss. I think it's because humans and Protoss are allied in like the main law, so they've got this sort of reason why there are stages where you fight the Protoss. There are fanatics or something. There we go, that's the reason. Right, moving on. I don't think they ever like talk to you or anything. You never meet them. So there's no particular story behind this part of the game. It's just an excuse to fight the Protoss. And in this case, they've got some magical gas vents that we need to take. We need seven cans of the stuff, but there is a catch if you don't get a move on. The enemy will seal off the gas vents and then you can't take a can from that spot. What you can do is send somebody to destroy the unit that's doing the sealing. The sealing happens slowly and it's done by a single unit. So if you go and destroy it, then you don't have to deal with this catch. For about two seconds, I considered dealing with it there. You saw me select a few units and move them slightly towards where I need to put them. And then I stopped and got distracted. I think I was playing Kind of like a small dog would play StarCraft 2. I just kind of see things and start clicking on them, being like, oh, I could do something here. So like I lowered some of the supply depots you might have seen, which I uh, guess discovered how to do, although it doesn't really help me in this situation. I just did it because the button appeared on the screen, I think. And then after like 30 seconds, I'm like, oh yeah, I was doing something for like one second. So there's some real like attention deficit gaming right there. We do go over and start trying to stop the ceiling of the thing but it's too late now. If I'd just made that order, like when I first started selecting the units and thinking about doing this, this would have been fine, but we screwed it up. It doesn't really matter because there are way more than seven places you can harvest the gas. It's just annoying to lose the ones that are right next to your base because those will be the easy ones to get. Well, there's this other one next to our base. Essentially, you send an SCV there to pick up a thing. The enemy usually counterattack, but only with a couple of units. And for this map, we've unlocked the Goliath, an anti-stuff mechwalker. It can attack both air units with long-range missiles and ground units with its gun arms. I wonder if it's only supposed to really be used for one or the other thing, but you can use it for both. And we'll see it became one of my favorite units. I started spamming it all over the place. I had this vague feeling that it wasn't a good idea to spam it for the simple reason that in competitive StarCraft 2, the stuff I was vaguely aware of, I knew players didn't really use these very much, like there was no meta for spamming Goliaths. But I'm going to do it anyway because, well, I enjoyed them. 
You can see my plan here was to have a mobile command center go and sit right next to the places where you pick up the gas because you drop it off at the command center. So having the SCV drop it off right next to them means it doesn't matter if they die on the way back or something like that. The enemy might try to hunt them down. So that's all good. It also comments actually that I was harvesting it from two places at once. So it's recognizing my cheek here and also slightly tells me off for doing it. We've got a pretty solid defense going with two SCVs harvesting the thing. The nearby enemies are busy attacking a bunker with nobody in it. So that upgrade where I got the bunker health really paid off right here. Eventually, it looks like I did put somebody in the bunker. I've got an SCV keeping it alive at like barely any health. So the SCV is just about out repairing the damage and a couple of marines inside will gun down the nearby enemies. So a very edgy defense there, but it just about works out and we protect the objective area and hold the enemy off. Meanwhile, we do have an actual ball of units that could have easily done that, but they're defending another place. Very badly, they're all out of position and such because I wasn't paying attention as usual, but attack moving forwards should do the business. The enemy have tons of flying units on this stage, probably because it's the stage where you unlock the Goliath. However, I believe Marines, your generic infantry, are also an anti-air unit. They can shoot up. And I think that probably is the meta, if I recall from competitive StarCraft 2. Just build 50 marines and a bunch of medics and medivacs and spam forwards. Seems to work pretty well. Well, we're doing it in a more varied sort of way. We've kind of got like a bit of everything in our army ball by the end. I'm just sort of building things willy-nilly because I didn't really know what was good. This was my first time seeing all of the units, of course. So we're just doing stuff. We do eventually find the enemy base at the back, but it was too late. I probably could have struck the enemy base earlier on with my blob to stop them from stopping me from taking the gas to make it easier. But it didn't matter either way, we got the gas and we didn't actually see the enemy base in the end. It mentions that somebody tipped us off that Tosh here is using the gas to do something nefarious once again. He's saying like he's not a ghost, he's a spectre. So. You know, f as a new player, I can only give this the literal reading of, oh, he's a ghost, huh? But he actually, he's a spectre instead of a ghost, which is like a different kind of ghost. I'm guessing they're talking about some kind of unit class or special organization. Again, you're probably just supposed to know that already. Maybe Tosh really is a ghost and he needs gas to live. That makes some level of sense, at least. Of course, one hour later, as it said, Rainer's back in the bar. Meanwhile, me, I'm down in the research lab checking out my next upgrade choice. Do I want 5% extra attack speed or 5% extra life? I'm going to go for life and I remember the reasoning behind this. I don't know if this reasoning is at all correct. I made the estimation that the way of interpreting a 5% attack speed increase is to just presume that it's similar to a 5% DPS increase and therefore is not very useful because the number of hits it takes to kill something is so low that increasing the damage of individual hits by 5% usually won't decrease the number of hits it takes to kill something. Therefore, it won't make any material difference. You're just like overkilling something a bit more if you increase your damage by a really small amount. So I went for life instead just because I didn't like that first option. However, that analysis is probably incorrect because if you think about it, the only way to abstract attack speed away as a DPS buff is in a situation where it takes a lot of attacks to kill something. I can't really be bothered to explain what I'm talking about here, but I think I was wrong to make that decision if you really think about it, if you like. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, of course. Here in the next stage, the goal is to stop a train, and there was this little note I discovered here that you're supposed to capture these vehicles that are like yellow units on the map, so kind of allied or neutral or something. And if you attack move towards them, your units will automatically kill them. And that time I caught it happening. Who knows how many times I accidentally killed the things I was supposed to be capturing, because I like to attack move across the map and not look at what my units are doing, as you might have noted. So I'm probably getting screwed over. This stage is one where the Dominion is transporting something or other by train, something valuable. I think at first we don't know what it is, it's just something worth taking. So we have to stop a bunch of trains. And I wanted to say about this and about the previous stage as well, that it's nice that so many stages in the StarCraft II campaign are gimmick stages because they didn't have to do this. Like again, I'm coming off the back of playing Supreme Commander, where the goal of every stage is to kill the enemy. And here, there are lots of like interesting stages where you don't necessarily have to kill the enemy, although it's often a choice, like we could go to the enemy base and kill them, but your actual goal is to hang about these train tracks and kill trains as they go by and it gets harder and harder to do so. And it's nice to have these different considerations. 
The only like question in my mind is that because you're doing these gimmick stages while also unlocking units, it can be like, I don't know, like two things at once is too many, that sort of thing. I'm too dumb for this. I wanted more time to get used to using the units and just see like what their stats were and how they perform before trying to make decisions using them in specialist situations like you have five seconds to stop a train that's going by. The game gets around these sorts of potential conflicts being a problem by just having it be easy, or to put it another way, even though I was thinking like I want more time to get used to using those units and work out what they can do, even if you don't know what they can do, the game's easy enough and unstrict about unit matchups enough that it doesn't matter that you don't know, essentially. So you could feel that as both a good and a bad thing, I guess. I didn't get what I wanted necessarily, but it was fine. It didn't cause any problems that I wasn't getting what I wanted, and I was still enjoying myself anyway. So I don't know, like, there's probably some slightly different version of StarCraft 2 that I would like more, that other people would like less, where it's more of a slow pace and it's more boring, basically, so that I could feel a bit more mastery of all these units that are just shooting by, some of which I will probably never use again or something like that because I didn't really get used to them or get any confidence in using them. I don't know. Please make the game twice as long, for free. I should note, by the way, that this, this campaign, the first campaign in StarCraft, is free, so I did not pay for this game, which, to some extent, waters down any potential criticisms I have. This is basically a free-to-play actual game, so, you know, compared to other free-to-play games, it's better than everything, really, so to some extent I can't complain too much, even though it's only free to try and trick you into buying something that isn't free, like the rest of the campaign or all of the microtransactions. There are loads of microtransactions in StarCraft 2, but they're really focused on multiplayer. So playing the single player campaign, it never tries to sell them to you. You don't really see the microtransactions. So it doesn't feel too annoying or like the game has lost something in order to provide that basis for microtransactions. I think it's mainly just cosmetic things anyway, since the multiplayer side is supposed to be balanced and such, you can't really buy any gameplay things. I am of the camp that I also dislike cosmetic microtransactions, by the way, since I'm here. There are some people who say that they don't care about microtransactions as long as it's not gameplay stuff and it is cosmetic. I'm more of the opinion that cosmetic stuff is kind of gameplay stuff in the meta sense, in that the game is still aiming to make you want to get the cosmetics, so this does still affect the game design in some way, like somebody is putting pressure on the designers to make it so people will want cosmetics, and that changes how the game can present itself and how it should present itself to the players. So there's something going on there that has literally no bearing on what's happening on the screen whatsoever. Well, we're just doing the objective. I've got my ball ready to stop this train. The good news is that it's the slowest train in the world, and it's slower than your units. That's why it's given you the diamond back, this laser tank thing, which is faster than the trains. So even as they pass you by, you can just walk behind them constantly attacking. And I believe the diamond backs can attack while moving as well, making them extra good at just sort of jankily following behind something that's trying to leave. And that does the business. There goes another train, with me barely looking at it by the looks of things. Eventually though, the enemy realise, wait a minute, somebody's blowing up all the trains. Once they catch on to that, they start trying to stop you a bit more. They build fortifications on the train lines, and I believe you can actually stop them from building them. So like, they're sending out SCVs to build them. And if you really had their bases under siege, you could kill all of the SCVs before they finish building them. There's me killing one on the way back from building something, so we'll go over there and see what it was. It seems that the bunkers aren't very heavily garrisoned, they tend to have like one marine inside them, so it doesn't really stop you from doing anything against the trains at all. I guess it's just something to do, you can go around and blow up the bunkers, there's probably no one in them half the time so it doesn't even matter. There goes another train, looks like they didn't stop us. I think each train has more and more units defending it, but it's never more than like 10, so once you have this blob that I have here, everything's fine basically. Although the blob itself has started to reach the size when it's going to become a problem because stuff at the back can't shoot stuff that's attacking from the front. Generally, ranged units don't have very much range because we're in a camera close to the ground kind of game. So although they can shoot through each other, which is very cheesy and useful, a lot of the time your ball gets less and less efficient the stronger you make it. So splitting it up into multiple groups would be advantageous. Broadly speaking, I didn't really do this because it's just a little bit more annoying than not doing it and you don't really need to. But here was an example where I actually did do it early on. So we've got this other smaller group I've started that's going to lead away the enemy blob. We actually draw the enemy off so the main blob can go after the objective, the next train. 
I do end up fighting that enemy blob, and we have this blob on blob action that's not very good for us. You can see on the right, loads of our units are just sort of glitching out at the back, because once they're out of line of sight, or out of range, sorry, they get stuck behind your own troops who just stand there, and they will gradually work out how to move around them and form an arc to get everything into range, but obviously that takes too long given the time to kill in the game. So big blobs can actually only really output the same amount of damage as a small blob, it's just that they can take more punishment because there's stuff glitching about at the back, ready to come in and fill in once stuff dies. And we'll see that this does impact the optimal build to some extent, like right here, having loads of diamondbacks and goliaths isn't optimal because they're really big, whereas loads of marines might be able to actually get more DPS for your money just because they take up less space. It's difficult to really assess that because the game doesn't tell you the range on units, so you can't really get a feel for it. I remember being a bit annoyed by that early on and then just forgetting about it later. The basic OVD analysis complaint cycle where I complain that I can't work out what the best plan is and then at some point go into zen mode where I just utterly stop caring what the best plan is and start attack moving into the enemy, which of course is very much how I began in this game. But by this point, well, I could tell something was wrong with that plan. And, well, we're just going to have to deal with it. And by deal with it, I mean do absolutely nothing. Another random side point is that there are various buildings in the game that are on a separate build menu for SCVs. So you might note I haven't built the armory, which is the building you need to upgrade all of your vehicles, of which I have quite a few. I just thought I couldn't build it or wasn't allowed to build it because it wasn't in quote-unquote the build menu. There are two separate build menus. There's buildings and advanced buildings. So I never really looked at advanced buildings for a while into the campaign, and thus wasn't using advanced buildings, so there we go. The game, generally speaking, is really good about tutorializing everything, but somewhere along the way I missed a very important thing like that. Well, what was this whole train thing even about? It was to capture this adjutant, a sort of AI assistant to enemy commanders. So this adjutant will have some intel for us. Reynolds like playing hard to get her. We'll see about that, heavily implying he's going to somehow get the information out of her. However, 21 minutes later, he's back at the bar drinking whiskey again. I just love this. I wonder how intentional it is. So many cutscenes end on a sort of cliffhanger where it implies something's about to happen. And then it cuts to Reynolds sitting in the bar drinking. Like that's always the resolution to every story beat. He got drunk again. It feels like it's overlooked just because they're trying to force in a cycle of mission and hub activity, but the hub activity does kind of like clash with what's happening in the plot and in the missions. Doesn't matter that much. Looks like I went for that flame turret as my next zerg upgrade. The other option was something that makes your command centers your main building for collecting resources. Shoot at enemies, which we don't want because if you've got to the point when you need it to be shooting at enemies, something's already gone wrong, so let's not encourage that by taking an upgrade based on it. Heading into the next mission where we're going to go after another artifact, here we've unlocked the siege tank. The siege tank was initially like my thing, I was like right this is it, we're just going to spam siege tanks for the rest of the game because it's the perfect amount of micro for me, slightly more than zero, so I'm not going to complain that it's too simple or too boring, but you don't really have to pay that much attention to it. Essentially, the siege tank deploys, making it static but have extra range. So that's a one-button micro thing, and it also has the advantage of being a very fire-and-forget style of micro, where you just switch something on, and then something good will happen while you're not there, and then you come back later to switch it off and carry on moving. So it's easy, but it's slightly more interesting than it just being a normal tank, and I was like, that's all good. There was a downside to the siege tank that I didn't realise for a long time, or for a short time actually, so I ended up not using it very much, we'll get to that soon. What's happening here? We've got another slightly gimmicky mission, which I'm appreciating. We have to shoot a laser at a door to get the thing we're looking for, but you can also have the laser shoot at some of the more powerful enemies that your base defences might not be able to deal with, which of course is sort of a trade-off because it means you're not doing the mission anymore, although I guess I'm not really in a rush, so like a trade-off where the mission takes a bit longer to have it be easy, I guess that's fine really. You can see my overall plan though was to spam siege tanks, you could put them in deployed mode at the edge of your base and they just function as a good turret essentially, and they'll just blow up the enemy as they come on in. You might also note I've worked out what I'm supposed to be doing with those supply depots by using them as walls for all intents and purposes. Since you can make them go into the ground and make them passable, they are effectively gates. And I did also remember seeing this in competitive StarCraft 2 sometimes, like people would build 
all of their stuff on ramps up to certain sections to make choke points and then with these buildings you can turn those things into one-way gates for only you to pass although it takes a bit of micro you also start this stage with an armory this allows me to get the vehicle upgrade that i couldn't get last time because to make an armory you need the advanced building menu and i probably still hadn't worked out that you press v instead of b after selecting an scv to access that menu it's a difficult situation where if you have enough buildings that it's going to flow over two pages do you make it two pages of the first menu or do you have two menus of one page well looks like they bamboozled me with the choice maybe i wouldn't have noticed if it was a second page on the build menu either something like that i like observations like this because you could have a huge ragnarok of ux nerds fighting over what's the better way to present a system of two menus to the player and there's probably no easy answer to that, so they would fight until the end of time. But it takes a real UX loser to be like, hey guys, it doesn't matter if the game just tells you that there's two pages to look through or forces you to go onto a page at some point so that you learn where it is and don't have to rely on pure UX design quality so that the player will never not find it naturally, stuff like that. But I enjoy the nerdery all the same, even though I'm just debating with myself right here, that's good enough for me. All I know is that I've probably said something that's right at some point, that's the great advantage of debating with yourself. If any of the views feel it is correct, you're the one who feel it at some point, so you can claim to be correct and ignore everything else you said. I'm having a great time playing StarCraft 2 once again, clearly. So for this stage I played things pretty safely for most of it. Since all we need to do is defend the building that is shooting the laser, we don't have to go anywhere or do anything, so a lot of the time you're just sitting here because the enemy usually aren't attacking you. We just become stronger and stronger sitting here and, well, the enemy's attacks do get more powerful but not to the same extent that you do. So it's fine really. And you don't even necessarily have to focus too much on defending your base because the enemy's attacks they kind of have these staging areas where they form up before they attack you and they're in your line of sight and you can just get the laser to kill all of the main things coming in which is what i'm doing right here you can waypoint order them onto everything you can see slowly but surely then it will kill them and hopefully if you remember to waypoint it back onto the objective at the end it will then go back to doing the objective of course our defenses are so strong that we might as well just keep doing the objective and let our units kill the enemy units well here comes a couple to fight a couple of our units that will be enough looks like we've got the flame turret there that pops out the ground once the enemy gets close very nice after a while it seems i did get bored of just sitting there because i decided to move my blob out and just start attacking the enemy bases you could probably do this earlier on to stop them from attacking you of course but you don't need to and i don't think there's any advantage in this stage either because the attacks are weak enough that it doesn't matter there's no like hyper aggression advantage to be gained by taking the enemy out early especially because the only goal of the mission was to do the laser thing which is now done we've broken open the door of a temple and we can steal another nice alien artifact i think we still don't know in the plot what these are as far as we're concerned somebody's trying to buy these things off us so we're just collecting them to eventually sell them but they will turn out to be very useful later on so that's that but once we go back to the ship Raynor is accosted in a corridor by a mysterious spirit there's a sort of horror section for about five seconds but it turns out to be somebody he knows it's a protoss that i guess was in the previous game because rain is just like ah zeratul and they have a friendly chat zeratul has these memories of the past or something or a different timeline in which the world is destroyed or the galaxy is destroyed it's something to do with the zerg consuming everything they're trying to destroy the galaxy as it turns out i don't know did we not know that i don't know how much we don't know about the zerg because i don't know so much but the point is he gives me this rock which allows me to see his memories and he says there's something really important in it i don't know he couldn't tell us what it was so he decides to let us learn the slow way by going through his memories in a rock it's gonna take a while we'll do that later the problem is i got distracted as you can see i loved it again that rain was like right okay we'll see what this is about and then the next thing i did was play the arcade game because i only had like two more minutes to play Maybe we are the chosen one who needs to save the galaxy thanks to Zeratul's mysterious gift of his memories. However, wouldn't it be better if we'd also managed to complete Lost Viking in the bar? And of course, other than playing Lost Viking, Rain is going to be drinking the whole time, as we'll see once we stop playing, of course. The issue, again, is just that the controls are kind of difficult, and I found it hard to play this game. It's simple in principle, but 
if you like see a thing and think I'm gonna dodge this thing, it feels really hard to pull off the dodge just because you don't have many movement options. Well, things went better than last time. I actually got nearly to the end here. We almost killed the boss, but then I get killed there by something or other. One of the issues I had playing, I seem to recall, is that all of those little carrier things, the fighters this carrier deploys, are kind of moving around randomly, and they were distracting me so much, I was like trying to keep my eye on where I am on the screen, but all these other things are moving around kind of close to you, and I kept, I don't know, messing up in some way because of that. Well, there you go. We have all the criticisms of Lost Viking. Reyna grabs a whiskey, and then, because I came back to play the game again a different day and had forgotten about the memory thing, ironically enough, I actually didn't do it, and that is a problem, because the memory thing turns out to be a sequence of missions, that are in your interest to do as early as possible in the campaign, so you might as well do them the second you can, and try and get missions to unlock the memory stuff as early as possible. But I didn't know that, of course, and I'd forgotten about it. So what are we doing here instead? We're doing this regular mission where you have to fight, well, a bunch of zombies. It's a zombie defense mission. Well, not really. This is a sort of gimmick mission, a less gimmicky gimmick mission, where you just have to wipe out all of the enemies on the map. But the enemies are infested humans, so sort of a crossover between Zerg and Terran, who aren't really that much of a threat, but there is this day-night cycle thing going on, where every few minutes it becomes night, and then for a few minutes the enemy will constantly spawn new units and attack your base. This is only really a problem the first time it happens, here's footage of the second time it happens, when, well I've barely got anything defending my base and it's fine, because they only attack you with waves of slow, weak infantry. Having one bunker with some marines in it, a really cheap setup, will do the business, and you can send all of your expensive actual army to do the actual business of defeating the enemy. And Tychus remarks that we should have waited until daylight or something, so once again the game's slightly sort of telling you off for trying to be a little bit too cheeky. I don't really see a reason why you need to be back at base, just because the attacks aren't very big, as I said. I think maybe... It should have been more serious so that there was more of a challenge and more of this gimmick where you had to go back and forth within the time limit and defend set areas. Because not being in the base is essentially fine, other than the first time when you might not have enough units to do both things at the same time. So, we're defending, we're attack moving into the enemy's stuff, and I believe the more stuff you destroy, the weaker the attacks become because the attacks are spawning from these buildings. So as you destroy the infected buildings, that might be making the night sections easier as well. The only complication is that they do throw in a third attack vector on your base where a new direction of attack opens up. But because I had noticed it already before, because there was like this destroyable terrain on a bridge going into your base, it was kind of like meta obvious they were going to do something like that at some point in the stage. So I already had the defenses set up before the challenge started and well nothing came of it essentially. Meanwhile, we're still attack moving into an enemy base another night. I've got another base set up in the top right as well to get more resources, which also gets attacked, although by like five units, so it's fine that I didn't really bother to defend it either. Here, though, was something that I remember seeing in my footage, and I wanted to include this in the video as an example of me not even knowing what I'm doing in retrospect. So I stopped the attack there for some reason, even though it was going absolutely fine. We're pop-capped. We need to lose units right here. I stopped the attack too, and that's what we're doing right now. So that's the problem right here. Like, I'm wondering, looking at this footage, I call off the attack, I go back to my base, I select some SCVs, so I start kind of looking at the building menu, I eventually decide I'm going to build a bunker. Why? I don't know, it doesn't feel like we're under any pressure whatsoever, we don't need this bunker, we've got nothing here to put in the bunker. And then I'm thinking, where shall I put it? Shall I put it over there? Shall I put it over here? Scroll the camera out of the base for a second there, let's go back into the base and put it somewhere more useful than outside of the base. Oh, here's a good spot, let's just put it there. Why? I don't know, that point isn't going to be attacked. So I had a good time there, deciding to stop everything to get many SCVs to build an absolutely pointless bunker. Here's my psychoanalysis of why I did that completely pointless and inferior strategy for a while. I think it's because I figured my army is doing so well I don't need to improve my military situation, but I do have free SCVs, I have space in my base, there's something I could do to improve my base defences in some way just in case. So for that reason, I decided to pull back to fully devote my attention to thinking about the base, but upon looking at it, I had absolutely no ideas for what to do, and decided to just do something, and so the something was put a bunker down just in case we really need it later on. 
and that was a massive waste of time in retrospect. But I think there's some kind of logic in there. It's just that it looks bad as I look back through the footage and wonder, well, what was I doing here? What am I going to comment on on my strategy here when it appears to be just do nothing, just stop playing the game suddenly for no reason? I don't know. There's no way for any of us to understand the strategic genius at play in this footage. All we know is it still works, which I think is more of a testament to the game being relatively easy than my strategy being relatively good. I'll also note, by the way, that I was using siege tanks in that mission. I think that's the last time I used them seriously because essentially somewhere in the upgrade tree, you can get an upgrade for siege tanks where it said something like reduces friendly fire by 75% and I was like, oh, they do friendly fire damage. They have area of effect damage that affects your own units. So when the blobs are clashing and the siege tanks are firing in, it hits you as well and I wasn't a fan of that. So siege tanks are out, even though I think they're a good unit. I feel like I also remember those being used quite a lot in the StarCraft 2 competitive meta, so I guess they're supposed to be good. Looks like this other time I was playing, I remembered this stone thing. So we can come and see what's going on here, and it turns out to be, well, first just a mission, which will turn into a series of missions. And these missions give you the research points to upgrade your units back in the main mission timeline. And because you can just do this completely separately, that's why you might as well do it first to get as many upgrades as possible, so you can use those upgrades for more missions in the main game and make it more worthwhile. So what exactly is happening in Zeratul's memories? Well, he is searching for the prophecy. A prophecy that has something to do with the fact that the Zerg are going to destroy the world. He's hoping that somewhere in the prophecy, there'll be some kind of loophole. But first, we need to find the prophecy. It's stored in three different buildings somewhere in a mysterious dark cave. There's the first fragment. And of course, what this mission is, is just moving this guy around. It's the classic control one or two units kind of mission that breaks up the pace of RTSs. And I quite like these because you can focus more on what you're doing, because you can use the abilities more effectively, you can study the map and what's happening specifically more effectively just because there's less stuff to look at and less to do. I don't know, they're a really welcome change of pace, I think. And I can kind of see how something like Dota or League of Legends evolved from this style of gameplay because there is something appealing about it. I have actually played League of Legends because I'm a degenerate, but I think it was only one or two times, and it was a very long time ago, so you can't blame me too much. But I feel like playing this, I'm like, yeah, I could feel why this would be a good style of game to have an entire game based around. Well, anyway, what's happening is that Kerrigan, Reyna's girlfriend who for some reason is leading the Zerg, is trying to stop us, get the prophecy, maybe just not very hard. I think Kerrigan also wants to see the prophecy, so maybe she's going to let us get it so she can read it herself. Not quite sure. But along the way, we can use Zeratul's abilities to kill various enemies. We do get a couple of Protoss units to use as well, because Zeratul can't attack aerial foes, so you need something else here to get through this mission. You also have the consideration that Zeratul is invisible, and only certain units can see him. These flying ones here are examples of units that can see him, but you can lock them in these void prisons to avoid being seen. Does that matter? Well, not really. Maybe in a specific circumstance you really need to be invisible. But it's nice when you're invisible fighting ground units because they just can't attack you. Like, you're not revealed when attacking, like in many cloaked in-gaming situations. You are just permanently cloaked if something can't see you. And they'll just die without realizing why. Quite handy. There was a secondary objective to take out Zerg bases. I actually only found this one here, so I clearly didn't explore the map enough. I was just sort of progressing through, thinking, yep, this is perfectly linear. But I ended up finishing the mission without ever seeing the other two bases, so I don't know where they were. I messed up. Towards the end, you get given this army to help you out, but it's AI controlled, so it's just a bunch of Protoss infantry who are kind of surprisingly melee focused. You feel like the Protoss are essentially the space elves and they'll have advanced tech, but they sort of have knives as their primary weapon on their generic infantry unit, the Zealots. A bit surprising, but very effective against the Zerg, I guess, who are their main antagonists, where bringing ammo is a bit of a waste of time because you'll run out long before you'd run out of things to shoot at. Luckily, the Terrans get around that by having infinite ammo cheats enabled. That's the secret. Well, we get the prophecy, and it says there might be some way to break the cycle or something. I'm not quite sure what the cycle is. Again, you might be intended to know this already from somewhere else. But Kerrigan shows up, perhaps to steal the prophecy, but she is distracted because the AI controlled units will fight her for you. Your goal is just to run through a gauntlet. You've got two minutes to make it to a ship that's waiting for you somewhere. I did stop a fair few times to kill enemies on this gauntlet. 
probably not required. You do get quite a lot of time to run this gauntlet, so I'm guessing you can stop and take out an enemy base or something to get that secondary objective. Maybe the thing you're looking to destroy is in one of the areas I ran past without really looking at here. Well anyway, we get to a point as the mission ends. We've escaped with the prophecy, but we need to find somebody else to really read the prophecy. It's in ancient language or something, who knows? Only the preservers of Zakul can really know what the prophecy is. So we pop back to Raynor in the ship for a while so we can spend the Zerg research points we got. I unlocked this Predator, a unit which is kind of like a giant dog and I never really used it. So that was that. I was more interested in this next tier where you can unlock a thing that gives you regenerating health on your vehicles. And I was like, that's perfect for your far and forget attack move strategy because anything that doesn't die will go back up to full health. Interestingly, you actually don't go back to the bar after that mission, but if you talk to the person standing next to you, Rayner immediately says, damn, I need a drink. So he's still thinking about going to the bar, but this time he actually stands by the memory thing, ready to go back in again. He's really getting committed to the role, Raynor. So this next mission is more of a real Protoss mission, where you're given a base and can use the Protoss economy and buildings. What we're essentially doing is a crash course in how to play as the Protoss. There is a full Protoss campaign which you can buy into with real money, but for the free version of the game, this mini Protoss campaign is quite nice. So we can try out the different things with the Protoss, and this is where StarCraft II kind of shines in a way that I won't really be showing in this video. It has these three factions, and all three of them actually play somewhat differently. They have different rules for their economy and buildings, and normally RTSs aren't brave enough to really commit to having the factions be different in any way because it's harder to balance. Here, if you limit it to only three factions, maybe it's not too much work to make it so that the various advantages and disadvantages they're all going to gain by having different gameplay mechanics will kind of balance each other out. So for example, as the Protoss, we can build structures without having to commit a worker to doing it. The worker has to initiate the build, but then it builds itself making it less of an economic commitment in that there's less opportunity cost to build things. Although on the flip side, you have to power your buildings with pylons. Although the pylons are something you have to make anyway for the pop cap, so I don't know if that's that much of a downside really. You also have a lot of units that have shields on top of their health, so if they don't take too much damage, their health will effectively regenerate without making medics or anything like that. In fact, you can't make an equivalent medic thing, so it's just a different way of achieving a similar mechanic They've been quite conservative, I guess, to make sure the factions aren't too different. But I think it's fun enough, and I at least really appreciate the effort there. Normally, you know, like in Supreme Commander, which I just played, the three factions in your three-faction system will just kind of be the same, because that's the easiest possible way of doing it. You just throw in some vague differences. Here, the factions actually have completely different rosters, and completely different, well not completely different, somewhat different economies. You're still just collecting rocks and gas. But now and again, you will have a different thought process for how you're going to go about that, compared to playing as the other factions. Probably. I had a couple of thoughts in this stage, that's the main commentary to make. I was alive, I was experiencing consciousness, I had all kinds of brain signals going backwards and forwards, perhaps something to do with what the game was asking me to think about, and I think that's an achievement in gaming. Now what's happening right here? Well, the Zerg also have like a Zerg Protoss hybrid sub-faction similar to the Terran Zerg thing we were seeing earlier, and they're attacking us. As we look around for the preservers who are being preserved in crystals somewhere on this map. So you have to hold off this infinitely repeating attack where the enemy have this little boss thing, a hybrid Archon that keeps attacking your base and just can't be killed so it will keep doing it. So you need to keep something back at the base to stop it from destroying your base. Meanwhile, you're going around to the map unlocking buildings at first. We're doing a crash course, as I said, in Protoss stuff. So like how the Terran campaign gradually walks you through and unlocks every unit and every building, here it's kind of doing that but in fast motion, so like walking across the map unlocks a new unit and a new building type. So we're really quickly getting the whole roster together since this is a very compressed Protoss campaign. I think it works pretty well, and of course the units, well I'm not going to appreciate them by just sort of being given a couple and being told to use it for something but they're simple enough that it doesn't matter that you don't have any real introduction to them. Like, there isn't a mission where it shows you how to use the Zealots or a mission to show you how to use the Immortals. 
you just get given a pile of things and well basically what I'm doing is spamming random things as they get unlocked and just attack moving at the enemy as usual. But here with the High Templar you actually can't do this. Finally somebody has stopped me. The High Templar doesn't have an attack if you attack move, they just move. Their goal is to work like a mage where you select them and use their abilities to do something specific and I ranted earlier about how that's a bit difficult to do when they are part of a larger group. You have to control group them separately to everything else to do that and for one reason or another I just couldn't be dealing with that level of effort. That's over like two button presses. It might even be like four button presses if you have to go back to selecting something else earlier. So we're clearly not going to be dealing with that. The only time I use the High Templars is right here, so enjoy this footage. I use their Psionic Storm to damage this incoming hybrid. I remember again in competitive StarCraft 2 seeing that the High Templars and the Psionic Storm are used very frequently, so they're considered good mainly by people who are willing to use their fingers to interface with the game. I'm only really willing to press A and click, so what we can do is have the High Templars merge to form Archons. When you have two High Templars, they can be sacrificed to create one Archon, which is a slightly better unit, I guess, in that it can attack move. I don't know if it's actually better. It's like a ghost thing that shoots lightning, but if you press A and click somewhere on the map, it will do all of the work for you. And of course, that's the main thing I'm looking for in my army. The boot camp is, can you move? Can you attack? I don't care what your stats are, don't even tell me. I'm sure it does tell you what their stats are somewhere, but I of course did not look at them. I was too busy doing absolutely nothing with all of the time freed up by using attack move. And check this out, did you see that? Caught live on camera, I actually did control group the things, the High Templars, so perhaps I really was planning on using their special abilities there. I really didn't remember doing that at all. Well, clearly I did know what to do, so I'm not lying when I claim I knew what to do here, but I was very much not in favour of doing it. And of course you can see why here. Like, here's me not using the abilities, things are going absolutely great. In fact, as usual I'm not even going to bother looking at the attack, let alone give any orders. Let's go home and make sure we're not floating resources, because that's something I'm more interested in for some reason. How's the attack going? Yep, looks like it's pretty much fine. Soon we reach the preservers and we de-preserve them by removing them from the crystals they were living inside. I don't know if they were trapped in there or if they are just themselves preserved as preservers. I don't know what's going on obviously, but they sense that we have the prophecy and they can read what it is even through our mind. The prophecy is that the aliens who created all of the various life forms in the universe and such are going to leave and on the way out they're going to ask the Zerg to kill everybody it seems. I'm not quite sure why, it's a very brief prophecy. Essentially the Great Hungerer is going to kill us all and they put the pieces together that the Great Hungerer might be talking about the Zerg who consume all living life. So incredibly they've done it, the infinite wisdom of the space elves comes through. We're able to make another upgrade decision from our Protoss tree. Do we want to have automated refineries so we can get gas without using our SCVs or do we want to be able to make two SCVs at the same time? This is an upgrade which is essentially, do you want a little bit more pop cap for units in the end game or do you want to have a faster game where you generate your economy faster which is essentially a much better choice in my opinion, so we're going with that. Now Zeratul needs some more info on this prophecy, he can go to the Zerg Hive Mind's Hive Mind and get some info from it, it's already dead but the corpse of it is still alive enough that you can get its memories out or something. Again I'm pretty sure it's referring to something that happened in a different game, but we plow on anyway. The point is we now have to go to four tendrils of the Zerg Overmind, the sort of main Zerg, and get its memories, which in effect gives us a very gimmick free mission, we just have to conquer a map to get to the four things. I guess the gimmick is that we're just unlocking more Protoss stuff and getting used to the Protoss a bit more, a very standard sort of mission. One of the units we unlock is this Observer, a nice invisible unit that can see enemies so you can use that to scout out the way ahead. Although because of my playstyle we don't really need something like this, I guess it's more useful in multiplayer. If all you're going to do is attack move forwards, you need to be using an army composition where it doesn't matter what the enemy have, like you'll always win, so you don't need to see what they have, like you should be focus on just getting the units out as soon as possible and not really spending time finding what units would be a good idea. 
because, well, that's a different kind of game really. This really is like a send a blob in strategy game. Maybe on higher difficulties you need to check what's there first, and of course in multiplayer that matters a lot more. But for us, yeah, it's just your standard <laughs> click on the enemy and they'll die eventually kind of strategy game, which I'm saying is both a good and a bad thing. Now Zeratul has got a few memories from the Overmind. He senses pain, surprise, and death when he finds this corpse. Really not the sort of extra information we were looking for. He's like providing this bargain bin psychic experience where he's essentially cold reading this thing. Like, yeah, yeah, we're gonna get a prophecy out of this, guys. This is all a justified military campaign. He doesn't have much to go on. Well, something that's happening is you could unlock a warp core thing over there by the first tendril, which in some way allows you to warp units to the front line. I never worked out how to use it or really tried to use it, so there's something that I just completely missed about the Protoss, some unique feature they have that we're not going to be using. The second tendril is similarly vague and completely useless, so we just continue on. Here's a nice feature of our new unit, the Colossi. These big walkers can step up onto raised areas, similar to the Reapers from the Terrans, where they can just get to impassable areas and be there. That's fun, isn't it? Usually there are resources up there, so you get a few bonus resources if you walk up there for a second and then come back down. And I think more practically, there is a combat advantage in-game to being above the enemy. I can't quite remember what it is, because it doesn't come up very often. It's something like, if you're above an enemy, they get worse line of sight on you, so they're less likely to be able to see you while you're firing at them, or like their range is reduced, or something like that. Again, I'm not quite sure what it is, and that's an indication of how much it matters, because it just didn't really happen, whatever was happening. Anyway, we get the third tendril, and uh, he senses that there was satisfaction in a plan set in motion, just the most star sign ass prophecy you could ever hope for. We're getting some really non-specific stuff out of this. Well, I hope it's all worth it. At least we're killing the Zerg. I think that's a good thing. So we're achieving something today at the very least. Once we get to the fourth thing, he senses an end. Hmm, this dead body gives me a sense of the end. I think I'm just as good of a psychic as Zeratul is. Well, I mean, in universe, magic is real and such. Like they actually do have psychic powers. They're just not very useful, as it turns out. They don't really give you any useful information. However, we're saved because we're visited by a ghost who comes to explain what's actually going on. It's the ghost of someone who died fighting the Hive Overmind. And I guess that happened in a previous game or something. But this guy, while he was in there being a ghost, got some more intel out of the corpse and has a more complete prophecy. Essentially, the Overmind was being controlled by somebody else. It didn't have free will. And Zeratul asks, like, who did that? Why? And, well, the ghost's like, I don't know. That's like the biggest thing. So, like, we missed out on the most important piece of information here. Somebody is controlling the Zerg. And it's kind of implied that it was the gods, based on, like, the previous prophecy from a minute ago. I don't know, somebody is somehow controlling the Zerg to destroy the universe. We don't know who it is, we don't know why they're doing it. But I guess they failed in the previous game or something, because the Overmind died. But just before it died, it captured Reyna's girlfriend and turned her into the Queen of Blades. This was all part of the Overmind's plan to break free of its enslavement by somebody or other. And that's the plan. <laughs> I don't know how or why or what at all the connection is. They've just got like these three plot elements and they're just going to say they are connected. They're not actually going to connect them, but they will say they're connected. For some reason, if we can rescue Kerrigan, the Zerg won't destroy the universe and will be freed from their bonds. And Tassadar here is like, forget what you know, Zeratul, speaking to me specifically, because I was mad at seeing the Zerg flapping their wings as they fly through space. It's just like, oh my god, please, please somebody, the physics, somebody. And interestingly, this time, after the mission, Reyna does go back to the bar and have a whiskey, unlike the other memory missions where he respawns next to the memory thing. So that's good. If you go back to the memory thing, there is another memory to go through. This time, the memory stone is giving us the Overmind's memory, and now that dead Zerg is speaking to us, so his memories are very transferable through people, through a ghost, through a stone, to me. All very nice. And what the Overmind's vision here is, is that if the Zerg aren't stopped, the Protoss will eventually be destroyed. Okay, fine, I think that's what we knew already. These prophecies are still basically nothing. But I suppose the twist is just that the Overmind doesn't actually want the Zerg to win because it knows that the Zerg are being controlled by, 
the fallen one maybe it was referring to there like which was a protoss zerg hybrid we've killed that guy before the immortal guy who kept coming back maybe he was behind everything in the plot of starcraft i don't even know who that guy was but something's happening the point is there's another protoss mission to do and again you might as well do it as soon as possible to get the research points it's a very interesting mission because this is essentially a parallel universe. This is like, if you didn't defeat the Zerg, this is what would happen. And what would happen is, the Protoss fight a last stand at this one point in particular, and your mission is just to kill a certain number of the Zerg and then die. So it's just like, not necessarily a try not to die challenge, just a try not to die too quickly challenge. You, you still have to lose to complete the mission, but you have to take a certain number of the enemy with you. So that's kind of interesting, I thought, an interesting take on the battle you're supposed to lose design. You have to lose it well enough. How Zeratul is giving us this memory from Parallel Universe, I'm not quite sure. Well, I guess what he's giving us is the Overmind's own prophecy of what would happen to the Protoss if the Overmind's plan failed. And the general point, from the point of view of Raynor, like the original story, is that Raynor needs to learn that if he doesn't save his girlfriend, the Protoss will die that's bad. I think it implies that like everybody has died and the Protoss are the last life forms left alive and this is the end of the universe for all intents and purposes. It's just not very like jazzed up to that extent. So Raynor has to save his girlfriend at all costs in order to also save the universe and maybe that will cause him to have a conflict later on, okay? There's your plot. We've got the plot out. Hopefully Raynor will understand all this because of course he is drunk the entire time, but maybe with a plot like this, being drunk would make it easier to understand, so maybe that all actually fits together perfectly. I do just enjoy the slight sort of fourth wall breaking implication that in missions like this, what Rain is doing is he's standing in the lab and he's playing StarCraft 2, like through three layers of other people's memories at this stage. Like, I wonder what Rainer's point of view is on this battle that we're controlling. Can somebody give me some more deep lore on StarCraft 2? What's even happening to Raynor during the memory missions where he isn't present, but presumably is seeing something of what's going on? Is he controlling it because we're sort of supposed to be playing as Raynor? I don't know. As ever, we must ignore questions like why am I even having a conscious experience right now and ask questions like where are the Zerg coming from? Where's the enemy base? Those are the real questions in life, I assure you. Well, the good news is this is a pretty simple map because you start off with your base covering basically the whole map. And while the enemy are implied to have a base sort of off screen, you can't really do anything about it. So really, you're just going to sit around in your base and defend against enemy waves. There are some enemy buildings out there you can attack, but the enemy are just spawning, so it doesn't make much difference. They do have a fair few powerful units. They're using the hybrid Zerg Protoss things, which are something to do with the conspiracy to end the universe, I think. Again, I don't really know what's going on, but in some way this combination of races is a problem. I think the gods are doing something. They're up to no good, those gods. And if you think that's a pretty loose take on what the plot's supposed to be, that's more detail than the Protoss know about, so I'm doing better than them at least. We do have, though, access to loads of flying units in this map, which is pretty handy. This reveals the true secret to StarCraft 2. I've talked about before how when you make a big blob of units, it becomes too big to effectively fight because the ranges on units are too low. However, this does not apply to flying units because flying units don't have collision with each other, which is really janky, but it makes them more effective as units basically because you can just make a pile of them and they'll just do the business. They'll happily like fly through each other to reform and get into a good position really quickly to start engagements, which your land units can't do. They spend ages walking about trying to decide if they should go to the left or right and by then it's already over. So, adding a huge pile of aerial units into your blob makes the blob disproportionately more effective. So I'll be spamming a bunch of air units in this mission. The other thing I was trying to do is get some good control groups going, which is a little bit difficult. Actually, the main reason that setting up control groups is difficult is just because you can't zoom the camera out enough. Our formation is getting to the point when it doesn't entirely fit on the screen. So if I wanted to say select all my fighters, I can't just zoom out and double click on a fighter, which is how you do it in Supreme Commander, of course. Or you could press Control A to select your whole air force, something like that. I was having a little bit of trouble just setting up the control groups because you have to keep resetting them up. Like every time you make a new fighter, you have to go to the fighter control group and add something else to it. 
It's a little bit annoying. I don't think there really is an RTS game that gets this right. Where, well, what I'm imagining when I say get this right is that there are dynamic control groups. So, like in StarCraft 2 actually, you can press F2 to select your army, that but more fine grain. So I'd press F3 to select my air force and new things being built are automatically added to that dynamic control group. Something like that was what I felt like I needed and I was just doing it the hard way of manually constantly changing what's in a control group so it was representing my air force split between fighters and the ground attack laser things. I forget their names. We were able to take a new base outside of our base, giving us extra resources to continue our last stand. Another concern though is that the enemy can actually spawn inside your base, so you're not just defending the three entrances. They can appear in the back lines as well, so you need to be a bit active and mobile. There are lots of turrets back there at the rear end of the base, so it's not too much of an issue. But you have to sometimes move your units to fight the enemy, occasionally in a fourth direction on top of the three very obvious directions. Incredible, somehow my big brain was able to comprehend that concept, and I think we should all be applauding this strategic genius. I was able to attack move all over this map and by having a huge ball of units that now includes fighters and aerial units, it's more effective than it used to be. In fact, I'm using the air units on their own right now because eventually the enemy starts attacking from two directions. So I've got the air force fighting in the north and the ground force fighting in the south. Not a very good way of doing it and it's entirely because I can't be bothered to split the ground force into two ground forces to defend partially in both directions. So I'm just sort of using the control groups I set up already and just saying, well, group one goes this way, group two and three goes the other way. Not a very good idea, but it's better than nothing. Eventually, we've defeated the 1500 enemies, which was the cap to arbitrarily decide that our last stand was good enough. I think in-universe, it doesn't matter whatsoever. They just decided to put a number on it, the Protoss. Well, there you go. Now you can die with no regrets. Interestingly, the dark voice, that is supposedly the thing behind all of this, I think it might be a god or something, mentions to us that if we hadn't killed Kerrigan, then maybe this wouldn't have happened. And Zeratul's like, oh, the Queen of Blades, how could we have known? And the answer to that question, Zeratul, is you should have watched the previous cutscenes in your plotline in StarCraft 2. I'm pretty sure we already knew that by this stage. But then again, I think what we're seeing here is the imagination of the Overmind regarding what would happen. So maybe the Overmind doesn't know that Zeratul has read the Overmind's mind and already knows this secret that the Overmind is trying to provide us with here. I don't know. So in context, the Zeratul of this timeline didn't know that information, so it's not a plot hole that it's being revealed to them here for the first time. Right? I think we've uh, got all of that plastered over and everything's fine. As you can see, the mission keeps going. The dark voice keeps taunting us about how our efforts are futile, and indeed they are, because at this stage, your objective in the top left is just to die. So I'm guessing like deleting your units or just going to sit in the corner might be a good idea. But if you want, you can keep fighting the enemy. Each attack wave is a little bit stronger than the last, so you should eventually lose, and you'll run out of resources as well. And I guess it's just for bragging rights, the counter in the top right keeps going up, so if you want to have a really glorious last stand, you can take even more of them with you. But yes, in universe and in context, this doesn't do anything. But you do get an achievement, as it says there, if you do a certain amount of stuff, I don't know. But as you can see, after a while, I've got no minerals left, and we're losing the base, we've lost most of the army. Now we're just sort of sitting around. All of the hero characters who I don't know about die off. They had various abilities, those hero characters, but I only really looked at what they were, like in the midst of my downfall, so I didn't use them very well. Ultimately, everything gets destroyed, and that's that. That's the end of the universe. I'm not quite sure why. We see this cutscene here where the hybrid Zerg Protoss seem to sort of absorb the regular Zerg and turn into new purple things. Maybe those are like the gods, I'm not quite sure. I'm guessing the Overmind who we're getting this info from knows what they are because they are imagining this happening so they're able to conceive of what's going to happen. Something, something, something. Uh, all of the stars went out. Not quite sure what the middle stages were to that process, but for some reason, this guy wants to sort of look in the cosmos as a pair of giant eyes looking at nothing, presumably. And it's his right to do it because that was the guy who created the universe, supposedly. So he can just destroy it and sit in the void again if he wants. But that's going to be a problem for us. Well, look at that. We've got all the achievements in the mission and that's the real thing. I don't know. So 
The prophecy is basically, if Reyna's girlfriend dies, it's the actual end of the universe because God wants it to be that way for one reason or another. However, God accidentally let slip in somebody else's imagination that there was some way to stop him. It's something to do with Kerrigan. What exactly? Again, very vague. But moving swiftly on, we've unlocked regenerating health for our mechanical units as the Terrans. That's what I was gunning for. All good stuff. Now our death balls will be slightly more effective. And following on from that, I also grabbed the science vessel upgrade from the Protoss tree. You had the option of taking that or the Raven here. I think the Raven is probably the better choice. It's like a bomber that drops turrets as well, which sounds pretty useful. But I was also thinking, sounds like I'm going to have to select it and click it and like use its abilities. The science vessel can passively heal nearby mechanical allies. So throwing those into your death balls, again, just makes them more survivable and last longer. So I thought I might as well do that because it's not going to take any more work than what I'm doing already to run with science vessels versus ravens. So that's good. We are now done with the Protoss sidebar missions. And the only thing I wonder about them is whether you can not do them and whether it changes the plot. Because ultimately, what you learn is that Reyna has to save Kerrigan. But that was already what he was doing before those Protoss missions. So I don't know if they would go so far as to change the plot based on whether or not you actually saw them. Maybe it forces you to do them at some point, I don't know. Well, we move back on to a regular mission. This time we're going to try to compete for a mercenary con contract with somebody because this somebody has the adjutant AI bot that we had earlier. We gave it to them to decode it. They're trying to sell it off to the highest bidder or something, but they're being betrayed by a mercenary who's willing to help us get the thing back if we pay them more than the other guys paying them. Something, something, something. It's an upgrade on the previous resource getting mission. Where again, you just have to get a certain number of minerals, but it's more interesting this time because there is somebody else you're racing against. And there are all these like scrap piles on the map. So exploring the map is much more valuable than it was the other time we had to do this because there's more stuff to find out there. And also because you're racing against somebody, there's an incentive to go for a heavy, aggressive play early on. They have various bases around the map that are collecting resources, and there are a finite number of resources, so there are many reasons to stop them as soon as possible. For this map, you also unlock the Vipers, I think they were called, like light tank things that drop mines. It was another unit I remembered from competitive play and remembering people talking about how good they can be. But at this stage, all of the mental memory space that I'm willing to dedicate to StarCraft 2 has been filled up. So essentially we unlocked this unit, I'm never going to use it because I'm just sticking for the future with the units that I already know about essentially and the ones where I'm like comfortable using them. So we're probably not going to see these good units once again. My early aggression strat worked well at first. I did take out one of the enemy bases but then stumbled into what I think is the biggest base on the map and sort of got dissuaded by that. Essentially, if I had gone south instead of west there, I would have had more luck. But we are about level with the enemy. Is another case where, like in the previous resource gathering mission, because you have to spend the thing you're trying to get to get more of it, you have to make decisions like how much do I commit to military? How much do I need to get away with this? So it's much more strict than previous StarCraft missions where there is a time limit and there's even like a real tangible advantage to playing optimally here and only using the units you need not relying on a death ball that simply can't be defeated as I usually do. So that was neato, we're doing something a tiny bit different. It's just not that difficult because as it turns out most of the map is only defended by well groups like this, a couple of marines. So really really small attack groups will be sufficient to take out a lot of the enemy's presence on the map and once you take out their mineral collection zones, they can become yours, of course, which is what we're setting up for there. And as you move around, if you bother to micro, you'll be picking up all the boxes like I am right there. So again, not just attack moving into the enemy base now has a real in-game advantage. Things are finally turned about in StarCraft, although it's only really just for this mission. Not that I think attack moving into the enemy base is a bad thing. I like being able to do that, but I also like that at least now and again, it just forces you to do things a little bit differently and to play things in a bit more of a detailed style. By the time I get around to attacking the enemy's second base, we are slightly losing the race, so we need to pull ahead. I'm also wasting some time, of course, despite the time limit, once again poking about building things in the base. I remember thinking or feeling that while I was playing, 
that I kind of lost the ability over time to use the hotkeys. I remember in the beginning, because you don't need to remember many hotkeys, I was able to do it fine basically and was able to slap down supply depots and bunkers by just remembering the letter. Once there were loads more letters, I essentially forgot the ones I had remembered earlier as well, so it all got overwritten in the confusion and my economy play was getting slower and slower, that's how I felt anyway as I went through the campaign. Doesn't matter too much. We eventually win this contest without actually destroying the enemy's third base, so it looks like killing two of the three bases is enough to comfortably get all the resources you need. What does winning this contest do? It allies us to this character, another character where it's like implying you're supposed to know who they are. I think it's the girlfriend of our second in command or something like that. And I think the guy we're trying to kill, this Orlan fellow, might also be somebody we're supposed to know. Long story short, if you win that little contest, you get a bunch of free units and another base, and the goal is just to take out the final big enemy base that I stumbled into earlier. So obviously, there are two things that come to mind here. Can you A, kill this base before the contest is over, and thus skip it? And can you lose the contest and just have to fight the faction that was pink as well? Something, something, something. It seems like there are more ways through this mission. We've done things the normal way, but I'm interested in seeing if you could do it the cheeky way, where you just rush the main enemy base and complete the final objective before it actually becomes available. What was that objective? To get back the decoded adjutant, as they're called, this AI that has intel on it. What intel does it have? Well, it has this recording of a conversation between Kerrigan, the current emperor, and Raynor, in fact, which to some extent Raynor should remember, I guess, I don't know. Luckily, somebody recorded it so he can remember this dirt that he's getting on the emperor. And I think the real dirt is that after the emperor hung up on that call he was recording, he stood there and monologued about how he's going to see the whole sector burned to ashes. I think the point of all this is that if you recall, we're trying to overthrow the Emperor of Humanity. That got sidelined when we realized the world's coming to an end. But also, now we have a good recording of this guy just like being a dick in general, so we can use that against him politically. It seems like such small fry compared to everything else that's going on. I guess we need to discredit the Emperor politically as well. Well anyway, moving on to another mission. It's another of the colony saving missions where this time, another colony is turning into Zerg and such as we saw before, but we have the option to either try and save them or the Protoss have showed up and they just want to blur everything up and you can side with them to just kill the colony. But our scientist says that maybe we can save them and you can side with her instead. In practical terms, I need the Protoss research that going the Protoss route offers more than I need the Zerg research. However, I am going to side with Dr. Hansen. We're going to put humanity first. We'll save the colonists. And as it turns out, they don't have the Zerg virus, so this is the correct option, I guess, in-universe. Although we're going to get some relatively unhelpful Zerg research points. Unhelpful, because I believe I've already maxed out the Zerg tree at this stage, after doing all of those Protoss side missions. Anyway, so what are we doing? We're going to kill the Protoss, because they would rather kill us and the colonists than see if the colonists really weren't infected or something? I don't know. Like, this whole situation isn't as bad as the Protoss seem to think it is, so another case of the Protoss just getting everything wrong, it seems, in the lore. Looks like they were attacking my base there with, like, one unit and I just wasn't paying any attention to it. Oh well, here's the real action. There are various locations you need to evacuate before a Protoss purge ship shows up, which is the flashing thing on the minimap down there in the bottom left. It goes between the various white settlements and blows them up and you need to just clear out the enemies there first so that the civilians can escape. For this purpose we are given the Viking in this mission, a combined ground mech and flyer. So it's a fighter that can land and fight on the ground as well, which isn't terribly useful for the simple reason that you have to press a button to do it and even though I was saying earlier how one button micro is the perfect amount, here, I couldn't really be bothered, and also there is the bigger consideration that having them be flying is more useful because of the bunching up stuff I was talking about. Here though is something that's even more interesting than that. We can deal with our bunching up issues by walking everybody into this dimensional portal thing, so the Protoss mothership can slap that down to suck units off the map. 
That seems like a problem, but it's only temporary, so a few seconds later we are back in business. But it does delay my attack and force me to withdraw slightly from the other direction to get the timing right on this. Well, once we have everything together, defeating this boss encounter of sorts is easy enough. You might also have noted I did made no effort whatsoever to not walk into the portal after it showed up. I enjoy seeing my troops get sucked into other dimensions, I guess I'm just that kind of leader. I just want to see what happens, like, off you go, tell me what happens when you come back. So we defeat the Protoss, and the game actually resists the opportunity to do a you win, you lose cutscene at the end. You actually do legitimately win. It doesn't go like, oh, we just about evacuated the civilians before the Protoss blew up the planet. We actually killed the Protoss, and that's the end of that. A happy ending of sorts to the Dr. Hansen line of missions, I guess. Because after this, she walks off into the sunset to go and help the people, I suppose. But of course, she cannot resist just before she goes, having a quick try with Raynor himself. It's not going to work, though, because Raynor is married to the law or something. You know, he can't commit to being with somebody because he has already got a girlfriend, technically. It's the one leading the apocalypse. We should probably go talk to her about that at some point. It's complicated, let's put it that way. Well, we do get a cheeky kiss and off the scientist walks into the woods. And Reyna is quickly back on the Siggies. We were rudely interrupted with our cigarette lighting attempt by this kiss from this mysterious scientist. Well, let's not pursue that any further. There's no time to be happy. And a couple of hours later, of course, it cuts to Reyna once again sitting, listening to country music, drinking whiskey in the bar, wordlessly sharing a table with Tykers who just stands there awkwardly. Back at it again. We're all having a great time in space. So moving on to the next mission, I decided to do the next Tosh mission. This is another one where it gives you a choice about how to play it, which is interesting. Tosh wants to let all of his fellow ghosts slash spectres, whatever he is, out of prison, but somebody else is saying, well, they are all psychopathic killers, and maybe it's bad to let them out of prison. I don't know. Well, Tosh says, if you let us all out, we'll help you kill Mensk. All right. So yes, you have the choice to side with one or the other. And this time, you get a different unit based on what choice you make. But as far as I can tell, they're kind of the same unit, so you're getting something similar. Do you want a spectre or a ghost? Two words for the same thing, they have nearly the same abilities. Who knows? Well, again, we're going to go with Tosh because he's the guy who lives on our ship. We don't want him to kill us at the very least, so maybe that's the right choice. This gives us Another special mission where you're controlling just a single hero character. And Tosh, like Zeratul, is invisible. So the enemy have a really hard time when he's about. They just can't tell why they're dying. They just stand there and die. So that's handy for us. There's also an AI-controlled Rainer faction who will be helping us out. They've got a nice mind blast ability to stun multiple enemies, but even without the stun, they do just stand there being like, huh, what? As they randomly die, kind <laughs> of looking around weirdly. All good stuff. So clearly that's easy enough to deal with. However, the enemy's anti-air towers can also detect you for one reason or another. They can detect cloaked ground units, but can't attack them. So what do we do about that? Well, at first I thought maybe there's a way to like sneak through the map and not go near these towers. Not really, we get shot again there by a siege tank. We've lost half our health and we don't have regenerating health, so we actually need to not get hit too much. What we can do is first try to stun the tower. I thought maybe it doesn't see you if it's stunned. It does take the stun effect, it just doesn't stop it from seeing you, so that doesn't help. Then there's our second ability, this shield bubble, which just gives you an extra health bar. And you just tank the damage from being seen and kill everything, and then that's fine. The AI, enemy AI doesn't react to seeing you. It's not like now that you're detected, other units will come from elsewhere on the map. Everything isn't aggroed. It will only aggro onto you if you're in its line of sight and in its range. So, getting spotted doesn't matter too much. You just use the shield to not die when you're spotted and kill the thing that's spotting you. But we also have some help from Rainer's Raiders. Here they come. We can use this never-ending stream of units that comes out of the Allied base to distract the enemy. And more importantly, we can use their medics here to heal. So we get this almost League of Legends-like situation again, where we're going through a lane through the enemy base. The enemy is sending groups of minions at us. We're sending groups of minions at them. And we're controlling a special character in the middle with abilities to use and stuff. You can kind of tell what's happening here. 
you can see a whole game being made out of this concept, and I think I said earlier that when I was playing StarCraft 2 and these missions in particular, I was kind of thinking like, yeah, this is good, and like maybe I actually prefer this style to the regular StarCraft style. I don't know, maybe I'm secretly like a would-be Dota or LoL player, I'm just too like high and mighty to actually bother playing them. That's probably for the best. We move on, looks like our gang of minions has built up over time so we're just sort of ploughing forwards here, and whenever we take damage we fall back and let the medics do the business to us. Looks like there's another tower ahead so we'll just wait slightly out of its range, let our guys be a distraction, then we'll go in and start trying to take out the tower first and foremost. That way, it doesn't matter if all of our minions die, as long as Tosh is alive, once the tower is down, everything else will be defeated by Tosh eventually, so you're sort of guaranteed to win. Although that said, they can run past you and start attacking the allied base, so you might want to pay attention and try to target the units that are trying to get past you. In this case, I'm not really going to do that, just attack moving kills, most of them will let a few pass, that's fine, and we'll move on. We're almost playing this like a tower defense game, but not quite, and again you can see the mechanics there, like totally could be implemented into this game engine and this overall game design. We're hanging back and stealing some health off this medic, while the main force, under our allies, goes in and dies, that looks good to us. There was a bonus area off to the side where you could kill some more enemies to get some money, I did that, and then we encountered a new aerial threat. This is the other air unit that I didn't take that was mutually exclusive with the science vessel, the Raven. This thing also detects cloaked units, so we kill it first, and that's really all the strategy that comes into things, also using the shield I guess so that we didn't die while we were spotted. Now that we're not spotted, a battle breaks out and Tosh is putting his gun in people's faces and pulling the trigger. In one way or another, they are not alerted to the fact he's doing this. His gun's really quiet, the muzzle flash is really dim, I don't know, there's more to being cloaked than just being kind of blue I guess, but it doesn't really come through in the game. Here was another challenging part where there's a raven patrolling back and forth, so I have to patrol back and forth with it to stay out of the enemy's detection. The enemies are kind of walking around and I was trying to work out, are they reacting to me being here? They seem to sometimes run away when you attack them, like they'd run away from the direction the attack came in, as if they do know they're under attack. Other times they just stand there and die, not quite sure what the rules are there. We also unlock nukes. Here's footage of me not looking at a nuke going off. It went off, well, at the top of the screen just there. Well, it doesn't matter very much. The only point to make is, obviously, I just played Supreme Commander. So coming into this game and being like, ooh, nukes, well, they're nothing. They couldn't even kill the building I targeted them at. It's like a small area of effect thing that does more damage than a lot of things in the game, but not very much. It's the world's smallest nuke. It's like a nuke grenade for all intents and purposes. Well, it doesn't matter, because our blob will just eventually kill the enemy base, especially with Tosh being functionally invincible. Soon we've captured everything, and if we, we release all of these prisoners, who are part of Tosh's special spectre slash ghost slash whatever unit, they're very dangerous, they're magic, didn't get many achievements, so clearly that went badly. Why did we do that again? I don't know. It does explain afterwards that Tosh is going to take his squad to go and kill Mensk, who is the Emperor, I think also sometimes called Arcturius in the game. Maybe he has two names, like many humans. Well, they're going to go and kill him. Luckily, for plot purposes, he actually doesn't, so that's good. The game doesn't end here. We'll just keep trying to do it ourselves and pretend that this meant something. Although Horner mentions that we also happened to release all of the most prominent scientists and artists. I guess there was some strict anti-free speech thing going on and everyone got arrested for political reasons. So by restoring the population's cultural base in some way, there will be a brighter future now that we've done that. Although Tosh also mentions that killing Mensk will just lead to somebody else taking his place and things probably won't change. We resolve this debate by going to the bar. Not only is Rainer here drinking, but Tosh is up in the corner as well, so I guess he didn't go to kill the Emperor. That's convenient, let's keep playing the game then. Some more humans need saving from the Zerg, this time it's the Mobius Foundation. The guys who have something to do with the artifacts, Tychus was going to sell them the artifacts, although we still have them at the current time, and apparently they know of the location of some more. And those coordinates are stored in buildings, I guess they wrote it down on a piece of paper and just locked it in the middle of a big building because it's the future, that's the securest way to get your important data stashed away from the enemy. Or is it because the enemy are now coming to look in the buildings? In fact, Kerrigan has come in person to look in the buildings, and we have to destroy the buildings before she does. 
Looks like early on I decided to bother scouting the area around my base, and I was punished for this severely because there's an enemy <laughs> defense building right outside where you start, and I basically lost the scout. Oh well. The main thing about this mission is that it gives you these medivacs, and I remembered again from competitive play that this is the thing to do. This is what the pro players do. They use loads of medivacs filled with infantry and just dump them all over the map doing stuff. So I was like, well, it's time for me to try and do this, but I found it was harder than I expected. The primary thing holding you back, or holding me back specifically, is that I've mixed in with the medivacs some fighters and stuff to protect them. And when you have the group selected, we have that problem I was ranting about earlier, where you can't use abilities of part of your group. So dropping troops is a special ability of the medivacs, but because the Viking fighters are at the front of the list when you select the group, they are the quote-unquote more selected thing, as I was putting it earlier, your hotkeys only apply to the Vikings, so you can't quickly dump the staff out of your medivacs without double-clicking on a medivac to get them selected specifically, or keep them in a control group. Now obviously that is doable, it's just one more step than I wanted, essentially. And it can be a little bit harder to do than it needs to be, I think, especially in the chaos of things when it might be hard to double-click on a medevac. Well, I eventually get the troops dropped, we blow up this building, Kerrigan was standing right there, we're not going to take the opportunity to do anything about her. We've, well, I don't know, in some way by blowing up the building prevented her from going inside to get the thing. And she's going to walk off through town looking for other buildings. She doesn't know where the data is stored, so she gradually kills every building on the map. But you only have to really intervene for a couple of them. The issue I have now is, well, a very stupid issue. Basically, the landed Vikings. I put the Vikings in their landed mode. And then when I tried to get the army back into the medivacs, the landed Vikings have gone in as infantry units, thus forcing me to leave loads of infantry behind. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> I was just getting annoyed by the medevacs, basically. Here's me doing the bonus objective. You have to go and kill a thing in the middle of the map. I think you have to have the medevacs for this one because it's in a completely disconnected area. I slowly work out how to drop everything off into a ball and now we'll get to business. The medevacs do have a second purpose, the med part. They act as medics, so you don't have to make medic infantry if you're using a build like this. So that's something. It gets them out of the way as well because they're not going to be blocking line of sight, which ordinary medics might do. There's us taking out that thing. And now we have the opposite problem to earlier, getting back into the medevacs can be a little bit slow because you have to like waypoint order the group into all of the medevacs so they will gradually fill them out. It's a case where a UI change would make this much more fun. I'm thinking something along the lines of designating a group as a drop group and you just press a button on a drop group and that will automatically put them into the nearest like drop ships on its own and the AI will work out how to spread them around the drop ships to make them all fit for you. Because doing that's no fun, kind of conceptually, like what the player wants to do is very easy. It's just the actual micro of doing it's kind of annoying. That's very much against the spirit of an RTS like this, where it's all about strategies not necessarily being all that complicated, but the execution of strategies being very difficult. That's why the skill ceiling is so high. Well, here I am. Can you lower the ceiling, guys? Guys, can you put a ladder down? I can't be bothered to waypoint order my group into the medevacs. It just doesn't feel like that's a very fun addition, essentially. It makes the game harder, but not better, I would say. I strongly suspect there is going to be some, like, hockey combination that actually does what I want. Who knows? Well, we've taken a second base location there, had some issues because the medevacs have dropped part of our strike group on the opposite side of a wall to the rest, and, well, just chaos ensues. The ultimate result of my frustration at trying to use the medevacs is I just kind of stopped and eventually realized that while it gives you this medevac unit, it's not that much of a required gimmick for this stage because while some parts of the mission are separated off and you have to do drops to get to them, most of it isn't. So we fall back to this plan, of course, just having a big blob attack move around the map. I'm going for the final data core here, and what do you know, it's actually in Kerrigan's base, the one place she didn't look, and we've got plenty of time left over to go and kill them. So we just very slowly attack, move, and kill everything. Pretty sure you don't need to destroy the base, but I was probably just enjoying watching the enemy health bars go down and not having to worry about putting these guys back in the medevac afterwards. Now once you've done this, it plays a much higher quality than usual cutscene. I'm guessing this is like a trailer or something that has been <laughs> implemented into the game. It's a sort of flashback to how Kerrigan became the leader of the Zerg, or at least a little bit anyway, not really. It's how she became a captive of the Zerg. 
and hence the Overmind, as we saw earlier, had some human subjects to do something with in its grand plan to stop the Fallen Ones from destroying the universe, which in some way required them to have some humans to turn into weird Zerg hybrid things. Still, not quite sure why. But there we go, that was good. <laughs> we saw a nice cutscene of Kerrigan killing people, and she was left behind in some military operation that Reyna was also involved in. Reyna blames himself for leaving her behind. I think it was actually somebody else's fault quite explicitly. I think it's the Emperor. The current Emperor was our old military commander. So there's some drama there, but again, it's sort of like just being hinted at and I wasn't paying too much attention. Then it cuts to what's really important. Reyna almost smashes his bottle of whiskey, but his friend catches it. So he couldn't protect his girlfriend, but he still has his hands on that precious, precious whiskey. And he immediately pours himself a glass and gets back to work. So yes, that was a dream sequence, that cutscene, effectively. But luckily, it conveniently tells the audience what's going on. Horner here is berating Reyna for blaming himself. And I guess he's right, because we just saw Reyna's own, like, memory of the events. And in those events, it isn't his fault. But for whatever reason, he's really annoyed about it in the cutscene anyway. He just blames himself. It's the same old bullshit, Horner says. They've got this real, like, old married couple thing going on. He slides something across the desk and then walks off dramatically. This is the intervention, which has been a long time coming. Everybody's gradually getting more and more annoyed at Reyna sort of not taking this seriously, I guess. And Reyna probably does see what he's becoming, but he doesn't care. He's going to pour another glass of whiskey. That's the second time in this cutscene he's poured a glass of whiskey. Keep them coming, I say. But what was that thing he left behind? It's an old cowboy and western sheriff badge. Because yes, he's the sheriff of the town the, the game started in or something. Again, I don't know. This game is so aimed at somebody who played a different game that this is all just completely wasted, all of this stuff. Speaking of completely wasted, it then says six hours later, he's still in the bar, <laughs> still drinking. Well, I enjoyed that. It's going well. If you click on Rayner, he's like, it's time for a bold, unstoppable plan continues to drink whiskey in the bar. He probably thinks he's doing a great job. You can't force him to leave the bar because as you go to other menus, he is standing there. So there you go, we're starting to get him back on his feet. In the armory here, you can poke around and look at the various vehicles you've unlocked and it gives you some lore and some animations. I thought that was quite a neat feature right there. The more important thing, of course, is to give them their upgrades. And I was tricked into giving the Vikings an upgrade here because I was thinking I need like a better aerial unit and the Vikings is what we have. But essentially later you unlock two air units that to me are more useful than the Viking and do the same thing or do different things that I'd prefer. So I wasted the money on that upgrade. What I was mainly focusing on upgrading were the Marauder, the Diamondback and the Goliath, which were things I was just using all the time. And then I didn't really focus too much on any other units. I got a lot of the building upgrades, such as ones that allow you to build with multiple SCVs at the same time. There's some things that increase your missile turrets capabilities, things like that. And there's one for the Goliath that allows it to shoot air and ground units at the same time. A nice perk for somebody who's going to attack move a blob of units, of course. Now, moving on to the next mission, we need to go and get another artifact. And this is where, in fact, one of the things I just mentioned is unlocked the Banshee, an air unit that focuses on ground attack. That's more useful for my composition because if I'm going to keep bringing Goliaths, I don't really need the Vikings to be providing air cover because the Goliaths do that already. Instead, I want to be using the space above me to fill it out with something that will be doing DPS. And the Banshee is the unit for that. So we wasted loads of money, all good stuff. It could also cloak and become invincible like some of the hero characters we saw earlier. Only you'd have to select them and trigger the ability separate to the rest of the group. And as usual, that's like one thing too many for me to bother doing, in that it's like two things. Like it's already more than the easiest possible way of implementing it, so I got mad and didn't do it. Now for this mission, it's relatively simple, sort of. Like you just have to progress across the map and kill some Protoss to get towards their base in the corner. But on the mini-map, you can see there is a gimmick to this. There's a wall of fire, a fire wave, as it puts it, that's coming across the planet. I was looking through my footage of this stage, and for whatever reason, I never looked at it. You can look over there, and there is like a giant wall of fire, so I can't demonstrate to you what's going on, because I just didn't pay any attention to it whatsoever. I was just playing. Well, the only thing you need to do is move what base buildings can be moved to the right over the course of the stage, and there are plenty of opportunities to do that. It is moving pretty slowly. You can see it taking out the remnants of my first base on the minimap there, because only certain buildings can be moved. 
What it's supposed to be is a supernova going off in this system, but it's too stupid to even explain what it's supposed to be. Like, the star this planet is orbiting has gone supernova, and the mission is called Supernova, and like the war, the fire from the supernova explosion is slowly enveloping the planet, like extremely slowly. I don't know, it's still pretty dark, guys, for an environment that has a supernova-sized wall of fire right next to it. But whatever, okay, so they wanted a gimmick where you had to move from left to right, and they, they found a reason. <laughs> they found a reason. And for whatever reason, I did not look at it during the stage. I probably was too mad or something. We're just going to keep moving to the right and keep well ahead of the wall of fire so we don't have to deal with it. And the stage is generous enough with there not being too much stuff in the way that you can move to the right pretty comfortably. Soon we've got our death ball going to work on the enemy's main base. And it's the new upgraded Death Ball with Air Death Ball included, where the Air Death Ball could be the more important part because you can kind of tell here. Our flying units are happy enough to fly onto the same spot and then all fire at once, which the ground units of course can't do, so that's the big advantage. You're getting more DPS for your dollar when you go with air units, so having a whole bunch of ground attack air units is pretty useful, I think. And it's going to do the business, although we did have to delay the attack on the enemy base because I realized I hadn't done the bonus objective, which was to essentially attack a different enemy base. So we waste some time, we're about to lose our main base and most of the stuff here. Well, I could move a lot of it out of the way, but I was busy doing nothing. I guess we don't need any stuff at this stage anymore. We do need to defend our little base up here with something. The enemy have one unit attacking my base. My reaction is to just quickly build an anti-air turret and we'll take advantage of having unlocked the ability for multiple SCVs to build one thing. What you can't do though is order like five SCVs to build a thing. You have to order one to do it and then select the other four to come in and join the building project after it starts. So it's a bit harder than it needs to be there. Still needs a tiny bit of improvement I think. Eventually, our death ball goes into the enemy's big base, blows everything up, and we capture another piece of the artifact as our own base was getting destroyed off camera. However, back out in space, looks like Mensk is warping in. The human Imperium is finally hunting us down. I think we were supposed to be meeting with the Mobius Foundation, and well, maybe we are actually. Well, I'm still not quite sure what's going on. Like, this Mobius Foundation is an organization to which we're supposedly selling the artifacts we're getting. At least it keeps mentioning that that's why we're getting the artifacts. But they're actually in the research lab, so you never actually sold them. Maybe only now we were going to sell them, I don't know. We'll see. As you can see, what actually happens is we go aboard the enemy ship and start killing everybody. Here's a shot where it really looks like Tychus should have said something, like, sorry for budding in. Sorry for giving you the cold shoulder, because he shoulder barged him. That sort of thing. They blew it. They completely blew it. Well, anyway, looks like Rayner shoots his way through the enemy's battleship, reaches the Emperor's chambers, but the Emperor isn't there, unfortunately. It's somebody else. In fact, it's the Emperor's son who turns out to own the Mobius Foundation that we're working with to do something with the artifacts. I suppose we overlooked that until now. Maybe nobody knew. Was this the secret? I guess it has to be. The point is, he tells us that the artifact we're collecting happens to be a device that reverses the transformation into half Zerg, half humans. So that's handy. We can use it then to get Kerrigan back into human form. And we know that for some reason that's important. However, they also want us to kill Kerrigan. At this stage I've forgotten. I'm so tired as I record today. This is just not the day for me to try and remember what the plot of StarCraft 2 is. Basically everyone's arguing that we're going to like put all of our lives at risk to go and get Kerrigan back because Reyna forgot to tell them about the prophecy where like we have to do this or the universe will end. So everyone thinks it's a bad idea. Only Reyna knows he has to do it. For whatever reason he doesn't say why. <laughs> I don't know. Like really could have cleared everything up here really easily. There's some conflict happening that doesn't matter and probably shouldn't have been happening. Anyway, the next mission just kind of goes back to business because we're going to do this thing where we steal an Odin. Tychus has this plan to use a gigantic robot to get back at the Empire, so he goes and steals this gigantic robot and we have to protect him while he walks around. This is actually pretty easy because of a very anti-StarCraft 2 kind of thing. Repairing units is really easy and unmicrointensive because if you have an SCV anywhere near something that's damaged, it automatically smells the damage and goes to repair it for you. You don't have to pay any attention whatsoever. 
So just very much against the spirit of like old school RTS for it to just be detecting optimal things to do and just doing it for you. That's a step towards like a new world, a new generation of RTS where many of the less interesting or easy but difficult to implement kind of strategies are smoothed over in some way so that you can spend more time, well, doing nothing, as I usually am with all of my time off in StarCraft 2. You could spend more time watching stuff blow up. That's always fun. I occasionally do that as well. Ultimately, the mission proves to be pretty easy, and it gets to the stage when it was kind of too annoying to wait for Tychus because he stops after attacking each enemy base to give you time to repair and build up, I guess. But my death ball here is fine to just go on on its own. So I'm going to cheekily go ahead here and just get started. I did sort of play very cautiously here, as you can see here, in fact. Like, we could just plow into the enemy with this ball and be fine. We're going to kind of wait around. I know I've got Tychus coming up behind me, so I might as well wait. But also attack moving just to the final point on the map would also probably be fine. Especially because losses don't actually matter. Like, to some extent, I was keeping the army alive more than is required. Because the old die, once the mission's over anyway, they're deleted in the RAM. Goodbye to my army. Back at home, we have our quick drink in the bar as usual. Tosh is there and he mentions that it's strange the Emperor hasn't killed us, but it's actually because he's trying to not make us into a martyr or something like that. So we've got some actual like plot reason for plot armor, which is all very nice. Tychus is impressed with the giant robot he stole. I think he likes you again now, possibly because you could have done this, this mission before the other mission that caused that cutscene where he has a falling out with you over the Kerrigan thing. Something, something, it's all fine. Where are we going with this? We're going right here. It's time to attack the Dominion. We're going after the Human Empire once again, completely forgetting our quest to save the world for the time being, as tends to happen, because we just want to kill the Empire some more. And that's where this giant robot comes in, because they think it's on their side. They don't seem to know that Tychus is piloting it, and he somehow got into this military parade. So you have this surprise attack thing where you get to choose like how to start the battle. And then you have a couple of minutes where you're just controlling Tychus and you can wander around the map killing things before the main stage starts. So you get a chance to try and soften up the enemy in such a way that you think the stage will be easiest later based on your build, because the various enemy bases around the map are set up to produce different kinds of units and are guarded by different kinds of things. Moderately entertaining, I thought, another nice fun gimmick, like part of the constant stream of slightly different things that StarCraft 2 asks of you, which I quite like. A nice dynamic campaign where there never seems to be two missions that are really the same like one after the other there's always some new little gimmick or thing or consideration to make even if it's just unlocking a new unit in fact which always makes each mission a bit different to the last very nice and this is something that the game does actually better than the other thing i keep comparing it to supreme commander because i played it most recently where the missions are very samey and it tends not to have gimmicks or special sections at all once the designated surprise time is over, we go back to our base in the corner and start to play this like a normal stage. Although you do also keep the Odin to use later, and you can now build Thors, which are smaller versions of the Odin. Theoretically, it's a good choice for my Death Ball, because it's good against ground and air units, and just has loads of health to absorb damage with. But it does have a unique disadvantage in that it's quite big. So again, the Death Ball studies come into play here. Well. What I did is sit around doing nothing for a long time, playing this in a Supreme Commander-esque style because there was really no pressure to leave the base. So I just chilled in the base gathering all the resources. I'm now researching on two armories. This is where you get your plus one attack and plus one defense, like in Age of Empires, that sort of classic upgrade system. But because they take a long time to go through, you can have multiple buildings working on those upgrades at the same time pretty comfortably. That means you might have to wait less time to get all of the upgrades. I don't think you really need the upgrades, and I presume the enemy doesn't get them because the enemy isn't really playing very hard. I don't know. Like, throughout the entire game, you're much more powerful than all of the enemies, and getting the upgrades probably just makes that worse. After a while, looks like I did move out with the Odin leading the charge there. This not only secures our second base point, but made me confident enough to be like, I guess I won't wait until I've reached the pop cap or something. Like Because there was no consequence to sitting around, I thought I might as well just wait until I've used up all my resources and then attack. But it's a little bit less boring, I guess, to just attack anyway. And once I realized how lightly defended the enemy bases were, I thought, well, let's just do it. Because of course, on this map, 
The bases are designed to be possible to destroy with just the Odin from the earlier part of the stage, and now you can attack with the Odin and something else, so basically it's really easy to take down these bases and I don't know what I was waiting around for. We are starting to see now the downside though of using these gigantic units, and again it's just because they block each other's pathing, and because the range on everything isn't very long, it's very likely that during a fight a significant portion of the fight is spent either with the big units walking about at the back unable to push through the blob to get into attack, or the other way around, like having one or two big units blocking off the entire army from attacking and they're all just sort of jankily trying to path at the back, trying to find a way to get around the side or something. The game is trying to get all of the units into combat, but it's not quite there. You can't like move in formation to make it work properly. Well, eventually we captured this base. You had to stand on a point to upload some data and I kind of thought, like, as you stood on the point, something bad would happen, like they'd nuke you or loads of stuff would come in. And, well, not really. They do attack you with, like, a couple of units. Afterwards, there's a cutscene where the Emperor's like, Reyna, it's you. Somebody woke up and realized that we're doing this at some point, and the Emperor's like, well, this time I'm going to kill you for real and stuff. You're not invited to my birthday party. And Reyna's like, yeah, cool, whatever. We're both pretty chill about this, we've got each other's phone numbers, we're just chatting as we kill each other. Very casual relationship we have going on. Arcturius orders somebody to come and kill, the kill us, and I thought like this was going to be a thing, because this voice he ordered talks again over some intercom or something, saying, let's kill them. But they do never actually try to kill you. Like, I was stacking up tons of stuff in all my bases, and as we see here, like, defending all of my expansion points. I don't know, the AI just doesn't do anything about you in general, so our death ball just gets bigger and bigger, to the point when it's probably, like, barely doing any damage. Like, look at the size of this blob. Half the time, all of these units won't be able to attack. All good, but because we're throwing in loads of Banshees as well, the air attack vehicles, they won't have all of those problems, and they will do most of the damage in most of the fights. I'm also randomly buying basically everything. You can see me once again prioritizing economy stuff over military stuff, even when the military stuff is, like, about to succeed. Constantly switching back to my base to try to spend some of my floating resources on something, at least until I have the pop cap reached. But if I was focusing more on just pushing my army forwards, we'd be doing absolutely fine and we'd get through this faster. I don't know, I just like spending the money, I guess. I spent all that time getting it. Let's buy way more units than you'd ever need. It's a bit like what I was talking about in Supreme Commander recently, where it's possible to become far more powerful than you need to. It's almost easier in StarCraft, because the enemy puts in absolutely minimal effort. Like in Supreme Commander, sometimes there will be hard encounters that require you to have some endgame units. Here, I'm pretty sure if you just spammed 100 pop caps worth of marines the whole time, it would be fine. Like, you never really see the enemy mass anything, except in that one stage where they massed some marauders as a special gimmick ages ago, if you remember that. Basically, I've got this blob of units, attack move waypointed all over the enemy base, and that's about that. Like, we destroyed the enemy base, probably don't take any losses whatsoever. It's like, the later and later we get into the game, you start thinking there's going to be some threat, like it's going to get hard. It just isn't happening, and I guess that's just what the game is like. You can increase the difficulty level, no idea what it does, but perhaps that would alleviate my death ball woes. But then again, I like watching the death ball mercilessly destroy the enemy with absolutely no challenge whatsoever. So I'm complaining about the thing that I like once again, it's an off ED commentary. The point of that mission was to upload the recordings of Mensk saying that he'd rather burn the sector down than not rule it himself or something, some Caesar-style rhetoric. And somebody points it out to him in a press conference and he looks really bad. I'm pretty sure the Emperor doesn't hold elections, so who cares what his public approval level is. It is mentioned that they can just spin this and like ignore this fact. It's an interesting thing because it was implying earlier that one of the reasons why the Emperor is evil is because he's like suppressing everybody, but he is freedom loving enough to allow there to be a free press that can openly criticize him on TV and things like that. So I don't know, maybe it's not that bad, maybe we didn't really need to kill everybody, maybe we really could have just voted this guy out of power. And I think our guy here says something like, we did more damage with one press conference than we did in a hundred battles. Well, there you go. Maybe secretly we should have been pro-democracy. Maybe we could have a velvet revolution. No, I've got a better idea. Let's put all of our money into this big robot, because now you can upgrade the Thor with the immortality protocol, that sounds good, which allows it to self-repair when it dies and just rejoin the fight. 
Sounds overpowered, but I never got a chance to actually use it. Because none of my Thors ever died. So ultimately I wasted that money, I guess, should have got something else. Well, the idea was there. Maybe my Thors should have died. Maybe that's the other point to be making. I don't think I actually made many more Thors in this campaign because I noticed they were blocking the pathing of everything and were just causing too much jank. We're going to stick mainly to air units. And in this next stage, we get another air unit to add to the mix, the Battlecruiser, a bigger air unit that can also clip into itself like the smaller ones. So it's still pretty useful. We need to go and get the final part of the machine that will turn Kerrigan back human, which might also coincidentally save the universe. It's on this alien ship somewhere that is defended by Ripfield generators, which provide this area of effect that does constant damage. And the way it gives you to get around this is that the battle cruisers just have so much health that they can just go through it and kill the thing generating the fields before it kills them. So that's easy enough. We can also use them to clear out the enemy from our base environs and capture some early free resources with a couple of marines. Lovely stuff. The area you start in is disconnected from the rest of the map, so we have to go in with air units at first at the very least to get into the main part of the map. Here the route to the next Ripfield generator is defended by these turrets. I started shooting them down while just taking damage from the Ripfield. This is probably a slower way of doing things, and I think I cottoned on pretty fast. From playing as the Protoss earlier, I remembered that the turrets don't work if these pylons go down. All of the Protoss buildings have to be near pylons to operate, or most of them, I guess. So, by killing them, you don't have to kill the turrets. And also, I believe the Ripfield generator does kill Protoss units as well, perhaps if they, they aren't near a pylon or something like that. So, you can deal with things pretty easily by striking in that fashion. Now we've already got the regenerating health upgrade and the science vessel unlocked. That means that even though I took all that damage from the rip field, we can bring the battle cruisers back out and just do nothing. They will heal back up to max health. So we'll be ready for our next raid soon. Meanwhile, what's happening in the base? We've got nothing left to harvest and I've got this army of SCVs doing nothing. And I was begrudgingly thinking, okay, I'll make a medivac. I didn't want to have to do this because I didn't want to have to move all the SCVs to the other island because it's going to be annoying. It's going to be loads of micro. The kind of thing where it's like, I know what I want to do. I want to tell the game to just do it and not have to actually do the clicking there because it's not going to be very interesting to pull off that quote unquote strategy. Well, there is one thing I can do, which is this. We'll need a new command center to fly over to the other island. And that's only because the old command center needs to stay behind to keep harvesting the Vespine gas. It's a shame you can't make, like, a supply pit. Again, Age of Empires man is here. Something that allows you to drop off the Vespine gas that doesn't have to be your main town center style building that also has the ability to build things and do special things. I wanted essentially to move my old command center to the new place. This doesn't matter at all, by the way, in case you were wondering, because you can just build another one, which is what I did, and then the second one will fly on over. You can actually put like five SCVs inside these things. I would love to see that be like 30, because you always have like huge groups of SCVs, and you're not going to have enough space to really move them with the command center, unless you bring in medevacs, which is what I'm forced to do here. Time to gradually move these guys over in groups by <laughs> picking them up slowly but surely and then ordering them back over here. Bang! Do it automatically game. I'm pretty sure actually in Supreme Commander there was a way to do this sort of thing automatically and I remember commenting that I couldn't work out what it was. So even if there like was a way to do what I want in the game, I probably wouldn't even notice it. You really can't satisfy me. I'm the immortal critic. I always have a reason to keep complaining no matter how satisfying your game is. Later on, we uncover an additional gimmick to this mission, which ties into the original gimmick of the Ripfields quite well. You can free these prisoners who turn out to be Dark Templars, the Protoss unit, who will help you out. These guys are invisible, like the Zeradar guy from earlier. That means, of course, they're just exploitable and kind of weird and like, it feels broken, but I guess it's supposed to be like this. You just walk around killing everything. The weakness is that some units can see you, which turns them back into normal units for all intents and purposes. But until then, we just walk around killing stuff. Because the enemy just have like a set roster of units positioned across the map, the game designers can effectively make it so that there are certain places you can go without ever being seen. And as it turns out, you can go through quite a lot of the enemy base without ever being seen. The enemy, like, revealing units, the observers, don't look for you. So while you're destroying things, it's not like they're going to bring over an observer to see what it was that destroyed it. They just won't react at all. That's handy. And it allows us, as we saw, to take out the Ripfield generators. 
in response here, they deploy this mother ship, which I thought it was going to come and attack us. It's more like just something that patrols around their base to make things a bit harder. Maybe it's possible to rush their base and just do the objective without triggering that little mothership to spawn. There is a limitation to our Dark Templar spam plan. This ripfield generator happens to be in a position where you can't walk to it, so they've set one of them up so you can't destroy it. When I saw this, I thought, oh, that means probably the rest, like going to the left from here, won't be viable for the Dark Templars. That's actually not the case. I kind of figured they would make it so you can't cheese the entire level with the Dark Templars. No, it's really just that one little corner that you can't go into. You can freely take out the rest of the enemy base. There is an observer, like, in the back of the far left corner of the map. Aside from that, you're free to do basically anything. The enemy have the gall to actually attack my base, revealing that I have this massive army that's doing literally nothing right now. We're playing extremely suboptimally because I was just kind of messing around at this stage. This is a terrible idea in any strategy game, but the good news is that in StarCraft, the enemy are also messing around. Like, they also have a massive army that they're not using to do anything. Any army that's on the field but isn't active is just a wasted potential. It's opportunity cost every second that passes you're not doing something with it. So, sitting around doing nothing, generally a bad idea. I think I mentioned already this don't float resources principle. It's the exact same thing with units. Like, if you make a unit and you're not using it, literally constantly, then that's floated resources. That's something you could have been doing that you weren't. And that's where having high micro starts to pay off. Luckily, it doesn't matter. And I'm not saying it should matter. Just pointing out that the way I'm playing is absolutely abysmal. At some point, I'd started using the Dark Templars to defend my base while attacking with the Flyers. I actually also had a ground army, might have seen there. Just wasn't using it. Until I got attacked by an air unit that the Dark Templars couldn't kill. So I deigned to move this ground army over to take it out. And then we'll switch back to doing nothing. Well, we don't really need those units because just the air units are enough to do most of the business on this map. The enemy do have a couple of anti-air units and they will occasionally attack you. But as you've seen, I've got these science vessels floating around who will constantly repair these things, which is free as well. The science vessels just regenerate their healing energy. So it's very resource efficient to just constantly heal up a high HP unit because instead of buying more HP, you're getting HP for free if you think about it that way. And you don't need the rest of your army, that's the other point I was making. At some point I noticed that we could just keep going with the Dark Templars. I saw the remaining Ripfield generators were still connected to the map. It wasn't the thing I suspected from earlier that they would all be disconnected. So that you couldn't do this. Well, the other thing they could have done to stop you doing this is have more observer units or have them patrol around or something, as mentioned. But they don't, so that's good. There's the tip for this mission. Once you get these Templars, you can do most of the mission with just a couple of units. Even one would suffice. There is an observer, though, here towards the bottom left at the back of the base who sees us, and we start taking attacks. I just kind of ran past them, thinking I'll just sacrifice these Templars to take out the Ripfield generator. But actually, the enemy don't aggro after you. They don't pursue you. I guess they lose line of sight and you go back to being invisible or something quite quickly. So we even get away with that, just running past the observer area. And that's all good. With the Ripfield generators down, we're free to just attack. However, that mothership is still marauding about, and this time I actually bothered to walk away from the vortex, deciding not to get sucked into it this time, so we've improved our anti-mothership tactics. Then I thought, right, we'll rush this thing quickly. But it turns out that vortex move doesn't have a very long cooldown. It's something like 30 seconds, and it lasts for something like 20 seconds. So it can actually have the vortex up quite a lot of the time. I guess it would run out of energy or something eventually, but in this case, we end up taking a fight with a lot of our units out of the fight, stuck in the vortex, and actually we take some damage to the couple of enemy units sitting around. Well, all we need to do is wait a few seconds and we'll get everything back. Now our death ball is here and we can finish off everything. I don't think you actually need to do anything with this mothership. It's just there to stop you from going to the objective, but you could just go there. Like, your goal is to kill a building in the middle of the enemy base. I was kind of being really completionist. I was going around the edges of the map, destroying everything in the enemy base, and trying to hunt down this mothership. There was an example where I lost most of my air force to a vortex, but then just pops out right in front of the mothership after a while and starts shooting. You can almost use this thing as an ambush once it uses it on you, because the AI won't pay attention to the fact that you're about to, for all intents and purposes, spawn in a bunch of units where the vortex is. So we get cases like this. We've almost killed this thing. It takes out all of our army but for one unit. We can use that unit to essentially just make the enemy come towards us a bit more. 
we've even got enough HP, we might be able to actually just kill the mothership here. Well, anyway, we can make the mothership come over here, running away from it, not really helping us avoid damage, but it does allow us to just suddenly appear on top of the mothership and it dies instantly. So that's good, isn't it? It didn't help them, and all, doing all of that didn't help me, because I'm pretty sure that just killing this building right here is all you needed to do, and you probably could have done that really early in the stage by just rushing a few units over there, especially the Banshees, because they can be in stealth like the Dark Templars. They could just suddenly appear at the objective and do it for you. Anyway, we captured the last piece of the Zelnaga artifact. However, at some point, the crew is now annoyed that we're technically working with the Empire. Or at least some sort of sub-faction of the Empire. We're working with the Emperor's son and his part of the army, which for all intents and purposes looks like we've just defected and joined the enemy. To the crew, anyway, they get mad, Taika starts trying to kill Reyna in the bar, they made the mistake of plotting their conspiracy in the bar, where Reyna is always there, so he was well aware the conspiracy was about to take place, and he intervenes immediately. However, Tychus has this sort of crossing of the Rubicon moment, when he pulls the jukebox off the ceiling. Are we supposed to think this is a bad thing? I hated that goddamn jukebox, but Reyna, Reyna loves it. I'm guessing that's the same jukebox that he stole from that 60s bar from back at the start of the game. Now, for some reason, he throws the jukebox forwards, Reyna literally teleports behind him and then hits him with the cable from the jukebox. So there's some sort of karmic revenge or something, like you can't defeat country music. It feels like Reyna should say something here, especially as it cuts up to his face for the close-up. He should have made a reference to the fact that Suspicious Minds is playing a lot in the bar on that jukebox, and these people have Suspicious Minds. Something, something, something. Let's tie that in. It's all important. Like, the, the use of Suspicious Minds over and over again in the game was actually a Chekhov's gun moment. Something, something, something. We're going to rewrite StarCraft 2. It's going to be a lot more about country music, surprisingly. Well, anyway, he actually almost explains why we're working with the Empire. He doesn't quite go all the way. Like, he's implying that we actually need to kill the Zerg, and it's worth working with the Empire for that at least. Maybe we'll still kill the Empire later. I don't think we've told anyone that, like, we have to get this device in to, like, stop the universe being destroyed by God or something. Like, there is there is a higher stakes explanation for why we should betray our old rebellion. I don't know. And maybe this son of the Emperor isn't as bad like he seems like a nicer guy than the emperor maybe it's fine to just like have the emperor off and have the sun replace him the sun probably doesn't mind that either he wants to be the emperor we can maybe get a puppet emperor guys we can do some byzantine empire politics well there's no time for that because it's time to attack the zerg homeworld and as we arrive they fly at us once again and i'm like oh my god like can we like just have them use some sort of space propulsion technology. I don't want to believe they can exist in vacuum, they can fly in vacuum, they're traveling around space by just flapping like crows or something. How are the Zerg a threat to us if that's how fast they can move about in space? Space is pretty big, guys. Well, anyway, within about two seconds, the ships are crashing into each other in space, and I say two seconds, not as an exaggeration, that is how long we lasted in that battle by the looks of things. At some point, though, Reyna's part of the army manages to land on the surface, and now we have a mission where we have to collect together the rest of the Dominion army. The thing I keep calling the Empire is the Dominion, by the way. Where the gimmick in this mission is that units will spawn on the map now and again, and if you don't go to pick them up, they die. That's the part that took me by surprise until I noticed it right here. I kind of figured it would spawn units on the map and then just give you all the time in the world to go and get them and add them to your army. They actually die if you don't go to where the drop pods are landing and save them from the Zerg. So there you go. This is the better way of doing it, I think. But I just, by this point in the game, didn't expect them to try and challenge me in any way. So I was like, oh, I just won't even bother doing the objective. Well, now they're going to force me to do it. I'm complaining, but this is also a good thing. And here I am going towards the objective before the Zerg go and take out the next drop pod. It's good that the first two were the ones I missed, because those are the least important ones. Like, after this, you start getting more interesting units and buildings, even. This next drop pod had a factory in it, which we can draw over to our main base to build more units. All very handy. Your actual goal is just to get a bunch of units. So it may indeed be the case you don't have to go after the drop pod. You could just let them die and just make units in your base. I presume they've made it so that there aren't enough resources to really get a decent army together. So you'll want to go out and get some of the free units that are dropping from space just for fun. You probably aren't going to lose the same amount of value in stuff to save those units versus what you get. Plus there are random drops like these ones right here, which you can pick up to build more units. What I'm saying right here is that not only was I playing the game, but that if I had not played the game, 
I might not have been able to progress in the game. It's happening right here. I am literally playing a game and I'm being so facetious about it because I think the game would benefit from being a little bit more harsh on players and like kind of making you play the game a bit more in other circumstances. But at the same time, I enjoyed not really having to play the game and having a casual chill time because as I think I've mentioned a couple of times in these commentaries, I virtually always play the games for this channel after work but before eating dinner and I'm always really tired and I like, can't be bothered to do anything. Which means I really appreciate strategy games like Supreme Commander, where it kind of feels like you're doing something, but it's actually really easy if you think about it. And StarCraft 2 kind of fell into that category. There's always something to do, there's always something you could do, do better, there's many ways to improve. It just doesn't really require anything of you. So you can feel powerful and feel clever pulling off a good strategy. But if you don't, well that's also fine, like you'll get the same result. It all goes back in the box in the end. As long as you do the objective somehow, nobody cares how you do it. I guess getting achievements is the only thing you can actually achieve in the game as it is. What am I talking about? I don't know. I'm simultaneously saying that StarCraft 2 is good and bad at the same time, and that, as I said earlier, I would be mad if they changed it in any way, but I'm also mad at how it is right now. So there you go, game designers, take that away. Here's your viewer feedback, the player feedback. The player hates the game, but refuses to accept any changes to it. There you go, go and work with that. After a while, we get the real objective of the stage, which is to go and save a particular drop area in the northeast on the minimap, you can see it there. We don't do that because as it turns out this time, I think you really do have, well, not infinite time, but a lot of time. I didn't go there like as soon as I could go there, and you totally could, like you just needed enough units to save that one thing and that's the end of the mission. But I spent some time wandering around, not necessarily saving the other drop pods either, you can see them on the map flashing away and I'm just ignoring them. It's because I didn't really know where to go, I stumbled into this enemy base and I thought if I hack my way through this base maybe that will go to the objective, but it's in a completely disconnected area so you actually can't, you have to go down to the bottom of the map, the bottom right, and then move up the edge to get to the objective area. So, I wasted a whole bunch of time, but I was having fun, I guess, just killing Zerg. It's another thing where it's like, we're totally overwhelmed, we have to get out of here, but what's actually happening in the stage is you're completely dominating the Zerg and destroying them, like, in every corner of the map and barely losing any units. It's going way too well for what the plot wants to be happening. Eventually, I do go and start <laughs> fighting the objective. I'm just curious whether it makes you fail the stage if you never go. Like, <laughs> will the AI eventually lose that battle in the corner? Possibly not. Well, it shows a cutscene of us rescuing General Warfield, very creatively named. He's the leader of the Empire's forces. Reyna pops up and goes, we came as fast as we could. Did we though? I don't know. Well, we definitely could have showed up earlier. It's all fine. This leads into the final section of the game, essentially. We're now hanging out on the surface of this planet, and it gives you a choice about how to weaken the enemy before our final showdown. This wasn't a very meaningful choice to me because I had no idea which one to go for. It's essentially saying, do you want to get rid of Nidus Worms or a couple of their flying units for the final stage? But with no information about what the final stage is, like you can't know what's a useful thing to pick here. So I had to essentially guess at my strategic instinct was to go for the Worms mission because I was thinking the worms allow the enemy to appear behind you sometimes and it's kind of annoying. Whereas loads of flying units, well that's fine, I'm probably going to make tons of anti-air units anyway and they'll just die in the mix. Like they can just go for blob on blob combat and it'll be fine. There's less strategy involved on that side of things, so we might as well take out the Nidus worms. Is that the correct decision? I don't know. Probably the real, like meta correct decision is to pick the one that gives you a more fun mission. So who knows what the other one was, but here's the mission to kill the Nidus Worms. You go into these tunnels under a volcano with the plan of blowing up the tunnels to some extent to flood them with lava more and then the Nidus Worms won't be able to move around on the final battlefield. A very dangerous plan, but maybe it'll work out. And the mission itself is another like hero-focused mission that reminds me of something like League of Legends as I keep mentioning. And again, as I was playing this, I was thinking, this gameplay, like just controlling a few heroes with special abilities and just doing like little micro strategies, it's kind of fun and it's kind of more fun than the main gameplay. I kind of preferred this. I think the reason is that you're always doing something. Like in the main gameplay, a lot of the time, it's attack move towards the enemy base with a blob and you don't really need to think about it at all. But when you're microing like four units, 
It's not too many things that it's overwhelming, but there's always enough stuff to like keep you occupied and keep improving how the battle is going second to second. So it just felt like I was clicking the mouse, giving orders, you know, pressing buttons on the keyboard. I was again literally playing the game in these stages to a much greater extent than in other stages, and it just felt engaging. I was having an enjoyable time, and it made me think, maybe I don't hate like Dota and League of Legends or something, I don't know. I enjoyed this style of gameplay for some reasons. There's not too much to say about it because in terms of the like mission design, it's just a massive corridor where you're just walking forwards across multiple maps killing enemies. And the gameplay is just about like how you're going to kill the enemies, like what order do you use your abilities in, when do you choose to lay down your area of effect things, and well it doesn't matter very much basically, but it was good. There was one unique part, which is the part I'm showing you here, where you have to sort of fight uphill against a flow of enemies. There are some worms constantly spawning new enemies, and you have to kill them fast enough to gradually be inching forwards to kill the worms. There goes one of them. And I thought this was quite amusing as well. I guess there's not that much they can do with this game design because there aren't enough mechanics, I guess, in the game to support a game that's about moving around fighting with just heroes. But I just enjoyed it to some extent. It made me think of, like, Dawn of War 2 as well. There's something engaging about the tiny strategies that come about when you're only controlling a couple of units, because you're just doing something all the time. I think that's my explanation. Like, it makes you think about things more so than in the bigger battles, because in the bigger battles, your strategy actually matters much less. And for one reason or another, I thought this was quite good. What I was thinking, though, is that because this only happens a couple of times in the game, I might have the opposite view. If the game was mainly this, and then now and again there was like an RTS stage where you controlled a base, my comment on the game might be, they should have focused on the base thing. Like, that was really fun. I preferred that to the walking around with hero characters thing. So maybe it's just the variety that was making this seem so cool. But that's a compliment for the game in itself. It's good that they bothered to have this here in the game. I remembered someone somewhere saying that like StarCraft II's Wings of Liberty campaign, this is one of the best RTS campaigns ever made. In fact, I think it was Total Biscuit who said that. And I think this is why, like it's a really dynamic RTS campaign with lots of different things to do throughout. It's very unrepetitive for an RTS campaign. It does a decent job of both teaching its mechanics and gradually revealing things and keeping you thinking about slightly different things in each stage. So you're a little bit more on your toes than you would have been if it was just attack move at the enemy all the time. It's still mostly that. It's still like just different versions of that because that's what the game is at the end of the day. But they've done a good job with it, I think, or at least they've done a better job with it than other RTSs that are like this, the isometric, close to the ground style of RTS, the old school RTS, as I put it. As with many of these games, it's the ability to zoom the camera out away from being a really good general purpose video game. Well, what's happening in the stage? I'll give a brief commentary on that. We're nuking rocks here and there. The nukes, you might have seen the nukes earlier, they're really small nukes, so it's a very disappointing explosion once you set them off. But I guess that's probably safer because we're in the caves, we're nuking at the same time. You just had to do it three times across three different maps, and I remember thinking it's quite a long mission. It's actually not that long compared to other stages. It's similar in length to the regular RTS stages in that you could complete it in like 20 to 30 minutes. But I guess just because you're doing something the whole time, I was like actually concentrating on what I'm doing and it felt like a longer time was passing and that I was doing more stuff in that time. I don't know. Again, there's something good about this style of gameplay and I'm just not completely confident that I like it enough to say that like the game should have been this or anything that extreme. But I don't know, it makes me think Maybe I should go and play a hero walking down lanes with a couple of minions game like League of Legends, which is basically this but more boring. At the final site, we have to battle the Zerg Queen, who is a threat but can also be aggroed onto the turret that your engineer can put down, which is basically the same thing with all of the units in this special stage. They tend to attack the nearest thing, so you can stand behind the deployable turret, of which you have an infinite supply and just let it take all of the damage. That's basically the strategy. So we do that a few times. Here I am towards the end, actually in a bit of a sticky situation. It looks like the Queen can stun you sometimes. And we're standing in this not very good formation, just getting owned really. And I almost lose that Engineer. It's yet another gameplay event in StarCraft 2. Just remarkable because like you never come close anywhere in the campaign to like being in trouble, or at least it never seemed to happen to me because I'm so good at gaming, but... Here was a case where something bad almost happened. There it is, there's the gameplay commentary. 
well, something bad is happening right now. I didn't think they'd bother doing this. You have to play the escape sequence where once you've blown everything up and the entire, like, underside of the planet's flooding with lava, you have to get out somehow. So you have another extra part of the stage where really you just run across the map and try not to stop to kill too many enemies along the way and it's fine. Once you're out, it goes into the final part of the game where you have to defend the thing until it charges up. It's a wave defense kind of setup, and I didn't really expect this, but then after seeing it, I was like, yeah, I guess this is how it needs to be. Because if you want the final mission to be, like, chaotic and bombastic, because it's kind of hard, and because the, the game doesn't really expect that much micro from the player, having it be a static defense mission is really the only way to do it, so that a lot of your army can fight without you looking at it or having to give orders. Of course, because we took out the worms instead of the air force, we're going to face a lot of air attacks, but because we know that's going to happen, we can just defend against it. They generally come from the same direction every time. It's a Supreme Commander-like setup, where the enemy's just going to make the same attack over and over again. So you just get increasingly prepared for it, and it actually gets easier as the stage goes on, even if the enemy are getting stronger. For example, we can do that right there and just put tons of anti-air towers in the line of assault of the enemy's air force, and we'll be fine. This doesn't completely cover you, because the enemy do attack from a few unexpected directions sometimes, and they have the Broodlords. This is an air unit that outranges most stuff. It sits there throwing more enemies at you, basically. So once they're there, I need to notice and send something flying out to go and kill them. Yes, once again, I am being forced to click the mouse to play the game. Absolutely outrageous. I probably secretly wanted to be playing a tower defense game, but no, I have to order some units around sometimes as well. Kerrigan actually comes over and fights you sometimes, which is good because we've got this anti-Kerrigan thing. We probably need her to be nearby for our whole plan to work. We really didn't think of that at all. Luckily, she comes over and plays ball. You can also, as you saw, sometimes pulse your special artifact to do damage to things that are very nearby to it which allows you to defeat Kerrigan a bit easier every time she shows up. There are also enemies in my base just sort of hacking at things. This is because I wasn't really paying attention to the fact the enemy can attack you from the southeast of the map, like where the lava is on the minimap. They tend not to, but now and again a few units will attack your base from that direction or an overlord will come by and start putting the zerg slime down there or something. And I just wasn't looking there really because I just thought, well, the enemy is probably just going to keep attacking from the same direction, which is mostly true, but it's not quite Supreme Commander levels of being able to ignore most of the map. They do also come in with this gigantic thing. It's firing these long range anti-air attacks and it was gradually taking out the air force that's defending the artifact. So in response, we need to go out and try to kill it. In this case, I'm going to run backwards because it wasn't working quite well enough by the looks of things. We need a bigger air force, and in this mission I started building a lot of the Wraiths, a unit I hadn't really used so far in the campaign. The Wraith is like your anti-air air unit as the Terrans. And I finally had a use for it. We've got a big anti-air requirement right now that can't be fulfilled by just spamming towers. I do have the upgraded towers as well that fire the extra missiles. So our anti-air towers are doing most of the work. We also killed Kerrigan again there in the corner. She was wasting time like doing some levitation attack on one of my Thors or something. That was all good but I'm not being very proactive with my air force. Like, we've got these air threats in various directions that are outranging my defenses. I need to be faster and probably have them on a better control group setup so I can quickly send them out to just take out these targets one at a time before they really do any damage. Not that it really matters because they're not doing that much damage. Like, when they attack you from outside of your range, it's with, like, one unit that will take a significant amount of time to actually kill a building or anything. So it doesn't matter that much as usual. We do also go out and kill the giant thing, so that makes our air superiority a little bit better. You can see in the top right that we have a lot of resources in this stage. You get absolutely tons of cash, so you can just build loads of things. I'm not even pop-capped right now, I could build more things than I have. So I'm actually not focusing on the economy constantly this time. My economy is not as good as it could be. We're doing some micro for the combat. Looks like it's time for another Nova as Kerrigan half dies right there. Kerrigan did destroy loads of, like, turrets and bunkers when she kept attacking, but none of the rest of her army did anything, really. This was, like, a not particularly, like, challenging climax battle to the entire campaign. One of the easier ones, just because you have so many resources and because you're so, like, ready for what's going to happen. So we keep killing them for a while, and in the top right you can see it's charged up a thing. The artifact, once charged up, does a thing. 
And again, I remember not being like fully sure what this was going to do, because I thought the purpose of the artifact was to convert Kerrigan into a human. It also makes all the Zerg explode, which is quite convenient, I guess. Does it make Kerrigan explode? Luckily not, I guess. Again, let's just keep guessing what's going on. Something good happened. Reyna goes out and finds Kerrigan, who hasn't quite turned back into her original human form from the earlier cutscene, but I guess she's more human than before. Tyker's still smoking inside his suit. That's got to be a health hazard. However, the real hazard is that he's actually following orders from the Emperor, who wants to kill Kerrigan. Again, I don't remember why. Look, this was all too long ago, and maybe it never even said. But for one reason or another, the Emperor is trying to get Tychus to kill Kerrigan. I think because as long as she's alive, she might, like, revive the swarm or something. But actually, the device has probably removed her power to do that, so we don't have to have her die to save the world. Something, something, something. I think, ultimately, the main character is right. That's probably the safe guess for what's going on. And said main character now has to make a choice. Let Tychus just kill Kerrigan, or he can kill Tychus. Luckily, Tychus was doing his assassination in slow motion, allowing Reyna plenty of time to <laughs> go and kill Tychus. And that's that. He then walks off into the sunset quite literally, with the implication being that this was the good ending. Something good happened, and maybe the Zerg were defeated by that wave, I don't know. Did that kill all of the Zerg in the galaxy? Who knows? It kind of pans up to a shot of like the human fleet on fire, f falling from the sky, and I was like, well, what am I to make of this? I don't know what's going on. Did we win? Somebody won. Did we defeat the Empire? No, I don't think so. Well, it's not supposed to be that conclusive, because this is the start of StarCraft 2. I'm guessing that at one point in time, this was StarCraft 2, like that was the campaign, and it just ends in a sort of inconclusive way so they could expand upon it. And indeed they did, there are two other StarCraft 2 campaigns, which you have to pay money for. Yes, once again, I should remind you that I did all of this for free, which partially invalidates my complaints. If you want to play the rest of StarCraft 2, you have to give them some money. But I was pretty much like done with the free campaign. I was like, well, that's enough. Basically, there's a Zerg campaign and a Protoss campaign as well, if you pay for it. But I didn't pay for it. The other thing to mention, which is like the elephant in the room, is that StarCraft 2 is in no way about its campaigns. It's a multiplayer like strategy game, an old school RTS, the classic setup that just has a quite like big campaign element that is completely unrelated to the main thing the game does, which I am not looking at at all in this video. I actually did look at it in the very first play session, the one where all of the footage got removed for some reason, the thing where it was like a blank screen or it was just like a screenshot with audio. Well, here I am right at the end looking at something else. I don't know what this is. There appears to be some other thing which reminds me of the old Battle for Middle Earth days where they had something like this, where like there were custom game modes that you would play online. There's something like that happening as well with like special campaigns you can play or challenge maps. My vague memory is that most of them were like Zerg wave defense, like basically that final mission, but as more of a game mode thing. So there's a load of that. But as I said, the main thing is the multiplayer. And the only thing I wanted to say about the multiplayer, which I don't have footage of, is that I was going through the like tutorials for it. Like the game provides a lot of onboarding to the multiplayer element of the game where it trains you and tells you how to play like some elements of the multiplayer meta, like build orders and playing fast and stuff. And it even has like these testing stages where it tests how good you are at things to put you into your initial ranking. I can't remember. One thing I do remember is I looked at the rules of multiplayer and it was something like in order to rank up like or play on the ladder, you have to play more than 10 games a day. It was something like that, like the first 10 games you play each day don't count towards your ranking. And after those like warm up games, you start playing games that do change your elo or something. And I thought that was insane, like they're asking for so much dedication to the game, like I'm guessing they're trying to cultivate only high level players like in the professional scene because that's where StarCraft 2 gets all of its fame and makes its money, I suppose. Well, it did seem like simultaneously, like really onboardy and friendly to new players, but also it looks like if you wanted to play at all competitively, you will really have to commit and put the work in. Like, if you don't have hours a day to commit, you can't even try. Like, you can't even be a noob. You have to be somewhat pro to even, like, be at the bottom of the ladder. That's how it seemed to me anyway. Of course, I didn't really try because I was done with Darkraft 2. 
It's time to move on. My overall review of StarCraft 2 was that I had no expectations whatsoever. At first, I was, I guess, a bit disappointed with the tone and the stupidness of how the game presents itself. But a bit later, I thought the gameplay was good enough that I was having a good time and I was looking forward to doing each mission and just seeing what was going to happen next because it had made itself so clear that it was always going to have something new to offer on every stage of the campaign. And I think that is a unique thing for RTS campaigns. They don't have to do that. It's more effort from the developers and it's more fun as a result. So a nice well-made campaign that... I guess it's incomplete, but then again I didn't pay for it either, and I think if you did pay for it, maybe you could get a more complete experience by playing the rest of it. Although because you don't play as the Terrans, I guess that means that Reyna's story is never going to be concluded. I'm guessing they're like StarCraft 3 teasing people, like one day the Reyna takes over the Empire campaign that the campaign of this game was kind of going to be about before it wasn't, will come back as the theme. Who knows? They're probably making so much money off StarCraft 2, they don't even need to think about such things. And of course, they don't need to think about the campaign modes at all. Overall, it probably is true to say that it's one of the better RTS campaigns, or at least old school RTS campaigns. And the fact that you can play everything I've shown you in this video for free, for zero pounds, for zero dollary dues, well, that's pretty good value. It's worth a look just so that you've seen it, I guess, if you're into strategy games, which is basically the, the reason I'm here. I'm like, well, I've heard of this game so much, people have told me to play it. I might as well actually dive in and play a strategy classic. I did it. It was surprising, sometimes good, sometimes bad. I came away knowing a little bit more about the world of online video gaming, and it was all some free entertainment. Well, I hope I've given you a bit of free entertainment by talking about my free entertainment. After this, I was like, I have to play a game that's not a sci-fi strategy game, because I've got so many more games like this to play, like lined up, like literally installed, because I keep installing things, being like, yeah, I'll play that next. But then I think like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should just try and have some more variety in my life, and on this channel, indeed. Well, I ended up thinking, let's find the least StarCraft 2 like game I can play and play that next so that my world is a little bit different. And I think I did succeed in that objective. I've actually got two full playthroughs of two different games that are both very much not like StarCraft 2 in various ways. Well, it's a Friday now. On Monday, I'll decide which one I'll be making for my next series. Something that's not this will be receiving an equally good commentary to this very, very soon, and well, you get excited for that, even though you have no idea what I'm talking about, and of course, as usual, neither do I. That's the special thing about these commentaries. I think I'll get out of here now. Thanks, StarCraft 2. That was a pretty good time, and uh, sorry I didn't give you any money. See ya.